Hey, very good morning to you. It is seven o'clock on today's show. Racist and wrong. Rishi Sunak condemns comments made by his party's biggest donor. And what's it really like to be an MP? Well, we've spent the day with a politician who says she constantly has to think about her safety. Plus, a call goes out for people with tattoos and beards to help train guide dogs. We'll tell you why. It is Wednesday, the 13th of March. Here are your headlines. Zara Sultana, the youngest Muslim MP ever elected in the UK and now the most threatened according to Parliament's own records. Someone who said, you need to be deported, you send that to Palestine, they are low on targets. A Sky News investigation finds hundreds of children using catapults to kill and torture animals before sharing sick images on WhatsApp. The government has introduced legislation to quash the convictions of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. We'll speak to the post office minister in just a few minutes. And pictures of perfection captured on camera. The winners of the World Photography Competition are announced. And we'll speak to two of the new title holders. Hey, very good morning to you. Welcome to the Sky News Breakfast Show. We start with some breaking news in the last few seconds. The latest economic growth figures for January have been published. Let's go to our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. Ed, break it down for us. Yeah, they've just come through, uh, Wilf. Uh, growth of 0.2%. Uh, uh, that's... Uh, actually more or less in line with the expectations. This is for the month of January. We get monthly uh, growth data these days. It used to just be for each quarter. But why is that significant? Well, 0.2%, uh, it's relatively decent when it comes to monthly growth. More importantly, though, as we all know, the UK has just been in recession. So this suggests... Uh, that we may now be out of recession. It may well be the shortest lived recession that we have had and one of the shallowest recessions that we've had in modern history. Uh, if these numbers turn out to be right, it's worth saying they can get revised quite quickly. And we also need to know what happens in the rest of the quarter. So we need the data for February. We need the data for March uh, as well. And obviously that depends uh, on what we'll see in the coming months. But for the time being, this is tentatively encouraging news and it suggests really what most economists have been more or less expecting which is that people are spending a little bit more when you look at the breakdown and i'm kind of just going through it right now because we've just had the numbers the breakdown suggests that it's the services sector which has provided most of the growth there uh, and we haven't had a revision to the previous numbers um, this is just one of those months where they don't revise uh, previous uh, numbers so you know if the official numbers still show that the uk uh, was in recession at the end of last year but if this continues, we will be out of recession very quickly indeed. Uh, Ed, does it alter the likely path of, uh, of interest rates for the Bank of England or, or one month's data doesn't, doesn't change things uh, sufficiently for that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it, it kind of changes anything in terms of people's broad picture of where we are. Most economists thought, you know, yes, uh, we were likely to be growing at this point. Uh, it looked from all of the spending data like people were kind of coming back to the shops. They were spending a little bit more. You had a bit more movement in various different parts of the economy. Um, so this doesn't really kind of change that that picture, but it does rather underline that the recession that we've kind of just been going through, I mean, famous last of words, because we need to see what the data does in the next couple of, of months. But it wasn't like a kind of traditional recession where you have high unemployment, where you have severe kinds of impacts on the economy where you have a big fall in GDP. It's certainly not been a great period for the economy, but essentially we've just been flatlining for a long time and the recession was just us kind of going below the line for a little bit as opposed to above the line for a little bit. These numbers seem to suggest that you've had that bounce back uh, post-Christmas. People have started to spend a bit more, uh, perhaps because of discounts, uh, and you're starting to see a little bit more movement. So I think economists will look at this, including at the Bank of England, and they'll say they're still relatively encouraged by it. But as for whether it precipitates them starting to cut interest rates soon, we'll have to wait and see. People most think that they will start cutting rates at some point this summer, uh, but there's a debate as to whether that's going to be in May or in August. Ed Conway, as always, thanks so much for that quick take on the numbers, which only just crossed uh, Ed and the team. We'll dive into them and uh, we'll have more analysis, of course, throughout uh, the morning. The headline, though, that the economy grew in January by 0.2%. Now, the Prime Minister has described comments by his party's biggest donor as racist and wrong. Frank Hester, who donated £10 million to the Conservatives last year, reportedly said 
that seeing Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. The Metropolitan Police have now confirmed that they've been contacted about the incident, which comes amidst rising concern over extremist language and threats to MPs. We'll have uh, more on that uh, in just a moment. But first, uh, here is uh, Mari. Mari, uh, what time of day did we get this comment from the Prime Minister? And what triggered it, per se? So, the timeline from when this story emerged Monday evening in The Guardian to the new uh, line from Rishi Sunak's um, spokesperson was about 7pm last night. So, for viewers who maybe have missed part of the controversy, we had a Conservative Party spokesperson reacting to the comments, saying uh, the comments were nothing to do with race or gender. We then had Graham Stewart talking to you yesterday on Sky News, very uncomfortable car crash interview where he said he welcomed money from anyone willing to support the Conservative Party, therefore suggesting that the Conservative Party would have to take money from anyone with kind, these kinds of views. We then had Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, Cabinet Minister, go on the airwaves and double down on that Conservative Party line and say it's nothing to do with race or gender. A few hours later, we then have Kemi Badenoch, the only black woman in Cabinet. She breaks ranks and comes out and says, it is racist and it is wrong. Two, three hours later, about 7 p.m., the Prime Minister then looks like he's been bounced into saying, yes, it was racist, despite the fact that his spokesperson repeatedly declined to say it was racist when asked by lobby journalists in lobby briefings in Downing Street. So that's the timeline. We've then had uh, a Tory MP, Marcus Fish, suggest, for instance, potentially uh, Frank Hester should match that £10 million pound donation. Rather than taking it back, he should match it and then invest it in young people services, underprivileged youth services, for example, and trying to make good on a bad situation. And then we've now had more revelations in The Guardian about other slightly dubious comments made by Frank Hester as well. That is where we are at the moment. And I think a lot of people will be frustrated, a lot of MPs, I think, behind the scenes will be frustrated about how long it took the Prime Minister to say the words, yes, it was racist, which anyone with eyes would have known it was racist. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting as well, the extent to which Kemi Bade not broke ranks uh, to, to, to make that initial statement and uh, whether the Prime Minister was bounced into it or whether the problem was just a delay uh, and the time uh, delay uh, not necessarily excusable either way. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, we'll pick up the discussion again in just a moment but uh, we also wanted to bring this report from Serena Barker Singh who spent the day in Coventry with uh, the MP Zara Sultana who has described some of the threats that she has been facing as an MP. Zara Sultana. Recording the time and the location on a constituency visit, this is one of the many security precautions this Labour MP has to take before every single event. This year, she's found out that she's received the most threats and serious abuse of any MP online, 68% more than the next most targeted MP. She says a notable uptick since speaking up about the rights of the Palestinian people. What do you get online? I'll, I'll start off with someone who said, you need to be deported, you Send that to Palestine, they are low on targets. Just going to speak MPs' duties have become more risky for members under threat. In the back of minds are the two MPs killed in their constituencies. House conventions have also been upended by safety concerns. Parliamentary authorities know safety is fundamental to democracy and offer a number of security measures for members. Door knocking can be one of the most exposing moments for an MP. It's for Zara, she says the majority of her abuse, 54%, has been categorised as Islamophobic. I think the Prime Minister has used his platform to whip up fear, hate and Islamophobia. And that is incredibly dangerous. The Prime Minister disputes this, saying he has called out Islamists and the far right, but expressed concern about protests like this one. Zara says it's vital she attends these demonstrations to represent her constituents and community. The more you're in the public sphere, it feels like the more you're being attacked. It weighs heavily. Um, it's difficult, but I remind myself why I, why I got involved in politics in the first place. and. I'm reminded about all of these values that I have that I share with millions of other people across the country. 
Zara says she will now increase her security measures. For some MPs, though, the risks are still too high and said they have had no choice but to step down before the next general election. Serena Bakasing, Sky News. Mari, I mean, that report from Serena kind of highlights the context within which this spat arose yesterday. Absolutely, and I think that's what's really important to remember is we've had a huge government conversation about extremism, about protecting MP safety, more funding for MP safety, and that's why these are connected, because daily life for MPs can sometimes be quite dangerous, quite threatening, especially some MPs more than others who are specifically targeted, and therefore this racism spat speaks to that threat and therefore flippantly saying an MP should be shot or should be assassinated. I mean, if you read the quotes, he goes on to say she should die, um, is actually more important and more uh, poignant than it might first occur when we have had MPs who genuinely have been murdered. Um, and that's why it's, it's so relevant. Mari, well, certainly is. Mari, thanks so much for that. We'll be speaking to the minister today, is Kevin Honorate, Minister for Postal Affairs. Lots to discuss with him uh, today, but we'll pick up on uh, some of the fallout from those uh, comments uh, as well. Now, we mentioned at the top of the show uh, that uh, GDP figures crossed, uh, growing 0.2% for the month of January. Well, in the last few minutes, the Chancellor, uh, Jeremy Hunt, has released the following statement. Uh, Quote, while the last few years have been tough, today's numbers show we're making progress in growing the economy, part of which makes it possible to bring down national insurance contributions by £900 this coming year. But if we want the rate of growth to pick up more, we need to make work pay, which means ending the unfairness of taxing work twice. Uh, that, uh, of course, a reference to his recent cuts in the national insurance contribution rate uh, in the budget. He cut it by a further two points, as he had done in the autumn uh, statement. Uh, more analysis, of course, to come throughout the morning on those GDP uh, numbers. But, uh, Leah, time for the other top stories. Thank you very much. So what do we have coming up? Well, it's almost official. Joe Biden and Donald Trump will face each other in November's US election. Uh, president Joe Biden, former President Donald Trump, have secured enough delegates to win their party's presidential nominations. That's after primaries in Georgia, Mississippi and Washington and Hawaii's Republican caucuses. Ukraine has launched a series of drone attacks on Russia for the second night in a row. That's according to officials. 58 drones were shot overnight, again targeting facilities. According to the Russian Defence Ministry, the overnight attacks on Tuesday hit energy facilities deep inside Russia, including the Nishri Novgorod region. And according to Kyiv, at least two more people have been killed last night in Russia's attacks on Ukraine's eastern regions. On Tuesday, Russia claimed to have killed 234 fighters, uh, stopping an incursion from across its border with Ukraine. Well, soldiers who Ukraine says are fighting volunteers, fighting for Kyiv, claim to have entered into Russia's Kursk and Belgorod regions. In a statement, the Russian Defence Ministry blamed the attack on the Kyiv regime, also saying they destroyed seven tanks and five armoured vehicles. A long-time aide to the late Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny have been attacked in the Lithuanian capital, Vilnius. Uh, Leonid Volkov reportedly attacked near his home. He was hit over the head, apparently, with a hammer and sprayed with tear gas. He was treated for his injuries in hospital. There, great stuff. Thank you. Right, Sky News can reveal that children are filming themselves using catapults to kill and torture animals in a UK wide uh, network on WhatsApp. Our correspondent, uh, Amelia Harper, joins us now uh, for more on her report. And, uh, Amelia, talk us through uh, what, what exactly you've uncovered. Yeah, this is really worrying. This has been part of a long-running investigation where we've uncovered that children are using, as you can see there, these handheld weapons to shoot and kill animals and, in some cases, even uh, abuse them. As part of this, I've had to review over 350 images and videos of animals being killed uh, and abused, as you'll see in my report coming up, and a warning that this report does contain some distressing imagery. Darkness has fallen. This, the setting for an execution. A bird singled out, about to be shot by children. The impact of the fall minor compared to the incoming kick. And this is the weapon of choice, a catapult. The victim this time, a squirrel. 
Sky News has uncovered a UK-wide network of animal shooting and torture carried out by children using catapults. Filming and photographing their kills, this material is shared on WhatsApp against their terms of use. An investigation has uncovered 11 catapult groups on the app with nearly 500 members like this one. We're seeing more and more injured animals being reported to us that have been hit by a catapult. You can go and buy a catapult very easily and use it to target animals, which is illegal and offences will be committed. And injured animals end up here. The Swan Sanctuary, which rescues waterfowl, has 20 birds, all with catapult injuries, in their hospital pens. Most of the injuries are head injuries, neck injuries, pure kill shots. They're there to try and kill these animals. Fractures to the facial areas, eyes exploding, uh, windpipes bursting. <sighs> yeah, it's... I'm sorry, I've gone. Causing unnecessary suffering to an animal is illegal. But when it comes to catapults, there's a gap in the law. People can buy them, carry them, and here they're being used to kill. The Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 is the relevant legislation protecting wildlife in England and Wales, but catapults aren't covered anywhere under those laws. Henry Smith is part of a group of MPs working to lift animal welfare standards. Government uh, and Parliament should look to legislate in terms of the sale of catapults and also for those who use catapults as a weapon to inflict injury and suffering, uh, that there is a criminal sanction to that. Big Canadian goose, dead as a dodo. Documented on WhatsApp, this rabbit just another victim of an emerging trend where catapults are used by children to kill. Calls have been made to tighten the laws. The question is, will it stop them? So you get an idea of the flavour of what is happening all across the UK. These are children from all over. And one thing we didn't include in that report, but we will have later on in the day, uh, were voice notes that were included in some of these uh, catapult groups, things like, I killed 16 things today, lads. Another one was, go straight through the rabbit's head. Another one, shot him straight in the head, boy, smack bang in the skull. Not one bit of kick, nothing, no little flinch before he died. So you can get an idea of the attitude towards animals here. The RSPCA has very much uh, been interested in what we've uncovered, and they have said, it's interesting, you've seen this as well, because they are now starting to see this as an emerging trend. They're having conversations with some police forces as well, so very worrying. Absolutely uh, extraordinary stuff, Amelia. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to have a very quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The rest of the week will stay unsettled with localised flooding, but southwesterly winds mean it'll be very mild. Rain will continue to clear in northern parts of the UK this morning while lingering across northern England, North Wales and much of Ireland. To the south, it'll be mainly dry, but there'll be plenty of cloud around, which uh, will bring some light rain to the hills. Scotland and northwest Ireland can expect some sunshine. That's your weather. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, today the government has introduced new legislation which will automatically quash the wrongful convictions of hundreds of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. Joining me now is the Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollenrake. Uh, very good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks, thanks for joining us, Minister. Um, so, so let's touch on this um, first of all. Uh, at each stage of this, uh, this process, um, the government in the last couple of months in particular has announced what it's planning to do, uh, announced how far it's going to go. Um, and within a day or two, we've seen various sub-postmasters react to say that it's not enough and it's not fast enough. And uh, I, I wonder if today's announcement, you think that draws a line under this for, for the government? I don't think people will... Uh, I don't think we can draw a line under it until every single person has been compensated, exonerated, then compensated. And we can't compensate people until we've overturned their convictions or quash their convictions. So, uh, so I think we, people will judge us at the end of the process, not during the process. And lots of people are, are saying that exactly what you said is that things is not happening quickly enough. But the government has moved exceptionally quickly in terms of overturning these convictions. 
We're doing something that's completely unprecedented. We're overturning hundreds of convictions on block. We'll have done that by July, and we'll be paying compensation to those people by August. So that's, in terms of what we can do in Parliament, that's exceptionally, uh, you know, very swift in terms of legislation and compensation. But it can't happen soon enough for many people, and that's why we're acting so quickly. Um, in, in terms of those uh, conversations you said, uh, highly uh, significant to be using legislation to quash uh, decisions mm. made by the judiciary. How many conversations have, have you had uh, with Alex Chalk, also with the Prime Minister, uh, about this? And where uh, have you decided that the line gets drawn, that this issue warrants that specialist action, whereas other issues do not? Well, lots of conversation, clearly. And the Prime Minister has been incredibly supportive as a Chancellor and everybody else in government supports what we're doing here. We did look at other options in terms of trying to overturn these convictions, but if you remember the, the Court of Appeal ruled first in 2021 that these convictions should be overturned, but to date only 100 of the roughly 983 exactly 183 convictions has been overturned so it's taking too long so what we're saying is we can't wait this long to exonerate people and to compensate them so we're doing something that's never been done before and we take this step very very cautiously very carefully but the, of the other options we looked at everything was going to take months if not years so that's why we're moving this quickly and doing it in this way and and i mean as you said it's a big step um do, is the trigger to go this far the fundamentals of the extent to which people were wronged and deserve this action? Or is it the attention it's got? You know, I mean, clearly, uh, the attention which was ca catalyzed by uh, an ITV drama has been profound. Is it a response to public opinion uh, and to serve that, or, or the fundamentals of, of the extent to which people... Well, well, it's both those things. The scale of the miscarriage of justice is, is horrendous. And so we knew that from the start. We, what we expected to happen is, as soon as the court case happened in 2019, and then the courts uh, overturned the convictions of 2021, we expected things would happen much more quickly, but for various reasons, for various reasons about the legal system, they did not. That's not to criticise the courts or the judicial system. These things are complex. So, uh, so yes, we've been looking for some time how we overturn more convictions more quickly. So, but, no, there's no doubt. So you, we had been looking at those things before the ITV series which we welcome that series to draw public attention to it, but, but certainly we are public servants. So the public outcry and this, of course, that, that gives us the, the kind of impetus, more impetus in terms of doing actually more quickly. And, uh, and that's why we, we've got, we know we've got the public on our side and we've got Parliament on our side. I think had we come to Parliament and said we're going to do this prior to the ITV series when it wasn't on some people's radar in Parliament as well as the wider public or in the, the media and said we're going to act in this way, in an unprecedented fashion to overrule the courts effectively, I think there would have been, it would have been a very difficult thing to do. But I think people understand now the scale of the crisis, so it does mean we can act more quickly. It's, it's I, I don't read what you're saying as make, making an excuse there at the end of that answer for the delays, but, but some of the wrong sub-postmasters could read it that way. I mean, could you have ploughed on sooner before public opinion came with you? I don't think, honestly think we could have done. We were looking at overturning the convictions en masse prior to the ITV series, and we do many other things. For example, we introduced, for people with convictions uh, who have been overturned, we introduced a fixed sum award of £600,000 last autumn before the series came out to try and speed up compensation. We've also done that for the other two schemes as well. One thing we're announcing today is people went through the original compensation scheme or we'll get a minimum of £75,000. Before, some people, mm -hmm. we get about 2,000 people got less than that, were topping up those compensation claims. We're announcing that today. It's great news for thousands of people. So, uh, so you know, yes, of course, we, uh, of course we acted uh, based upon uh, the, the, um, the real concern across Parliament that was raised by the ITV series, but we were acting... Mm -hmm before that in the best way we could. We'll be talking to David Enright, uh, a solicitor for many of the uh, sub-postmasters, a little bit later, so we'll get his response. I um, wanted to move you on uh, to, to, to the topic about Frank Hester's comments that, of course, dominated things yesterday. Should the Conservative Party return the money he donated? 
I don't think that's what uh, that's the right thing to do. I don't think it's what we need to do. Um, I think his comments were clearly racist and uh, and wrong, and there's, there's no question about that. You don't judge somebody's character based upon their skin colour. He's apologised for that. Um, I don't think that means Frank Hester is necessarily a racist. I don't know Frank Hester, to be honest, but the fact he's come out and apologised, we should welcome that. I think he's trying to apologise personally to Diane Abbott over these comments, and, and that's the right thing to do, but I don't think that means... Uh, we should judge his character purely based on something that was said in a private conversation that he's apologised for. I mean, it's interesting you say so clearly that the comments were clearly racist. Uh, I had a conversation with Graham Stewart, one of your colleagues, yesterday, um, and clearly it took till the Prime Minister till late yesterday afternoon to say the same. So what, what happened in the first 24 hours such that your colleagues, your boss, couldn't say that? I can't speak for the Prime Minister because I haven't spoken to him about it. I've spoken to Graham about it. I mean, the situation was moving pretty quickly yesterday. And, uh, but I think, there's any, I think, as I said before, I don't think it's right to judge somebody's character by their skin colour. That's effectively what his comments made, uh, what his comments said. So it was clearly the wrong thing to say. He's apologised for it. I can't speak for my colleagues, but, um, but I think in terms of those comments, clearly they were racist. He's right to apologise. The Prime Minister's called them racist too. Um, but I think the key thing now is Mr Hester himself a racist. I, I don't believe so from what I know. I say I don't know him, but I, I think it, on, on the context of what we know in the situation that we know right now, we should try and move on from this now, and, and I, think it's, um, I think that's the right thing to do. I, I guess the, the, the only sort of step back on all of this is to say, you know, you've got £10 million or so we're, we're said to believe, either way, a significant number of money from him. Is the party content to, as we approach an election and people are going to judge the party, to spend that money to try and further itself? Yes, it's an important amount of money and it will help you further yourself, but it comes with a lot of baggage from somebody who has made racist comments, whether he's apologised and stuff. The party is happy to spend the money. Is that the takeaway? I think you, we should judge it in the, in the whole context. So we have got the most diverse cabinet in history. We've got the most, the first British Asian prime minister know, in this but, country. But, but, We're not a what, racist party. Uh, I, and I'm certainly not suggesting that. But, but I, I don't think it's equally legitimate to excuse comments because you have a diverse cabinet. I'm sure you agree with that. I do. I'm not excusing it at all. Uh, these comments were wrong. Racist is apologised. That's not, that's not excusing his comments. No, no, I agree. But I'm asking the question, is the party content to spend his money? Well, it, it, on the basis he's not a racist and has apologised for what he said, yes. OK. Well, listen, that, that's very clear. Um, the final uh, question I wanted to get to, there's been all, all sorts of little bits of reporting that Boris Johnson might come back to help campaign, whether he seeks a seat himself or not in, uh, in the next election. Does, does Rishi Sunak need his help on the campaign trail, particularly in certain red wall seats? We need everybody's help. I mean, this is where, you know, this is a hugely important election. You know, we absolutely think we're the right people to run this country. We think take, Labour taking over from us would be absolutely the worst thing for this country. If you look at what they're planning to do in terms of, in, in terms of how they'll run the economy, in terms of things like... I'm the business minister as well as personal affairs minister. I'm very, very concerned for millions of businesses around this country that will suddenly have a completely different employment framework where people will get employment rights from day one, which means employers will have to go through a four-stage process and an employment tribunal to actually decide somebody's not the right person for their organisation from day one. There are so many things that Labour would do, would introduce into our framework that would be disastrous for our economy. So it's a very important election. We need every single Conservative to get out on the streets, knock on doors and, and show people we're the right party to, to run this country. Kevin Hollerick, uh, really uh, interesting conversation this morning. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Lots more to scum here on The Breakfast Show. Uh, up next, uh, more on the post office scandal. We'll be speaking to the solicitor who's representing over 200 uh, sub-postmasters. We'll be right back.
Play Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Welcome back to uh, Breakfast. Uh, we'll have uh, all of the day's headlines for you in just a moment. But first, Mari's uh, joined us back here on set following the interview there with the Government Minister, Kevin Hollenrake. Uh, Mari, the final question on the, the, the sort of Frank Hester uh, part of the interview, I, I said, are you happy to still spend his money? The answer was, on the basis that he's not a racist, yes. Your take? Yeah, interesting. I think Kevin Hollenrake was trying to create a bit of clarity after the lack of clarity we had over the past 24 hours. I think what was still interesting, though, was he was insistent that um, Frank Kester's not a racist, but he also said he didn't know him. Um, and I think that's really interesting because you can't... I don't think you can judge someone either way um, if you don't really know them. And actually, I don't think it's for a government minister to decide whether a person is, in quotes, a racist. So I think that was slightly odd, but I think... You're right, he said they were happy to spend that money. I think Labour will have a field day with that because they are calling on the government to return the money mm. uh, and say that they shouldn't be taking money from people with views like that. Also, there's a conversation in government around... We heard this from Kevin Badenoch, we've heard this from the Prime Minister, the idea of there should be space for forgiveness, that there should be space for learning. And I think that's a very valid argument to make. But I think, nonetheless, the controversy is partly around the way this has been handled. A lot of political control controversies often really stem from the way they're dealt with rather than the controversy itself. And I think the difficulty is the way the government uh, dealt with this yesterday, uh, well, even the day before as well, that has created a kind of a muddying of the water. Um, it's also interesting that again and again we hear something from government ministers, which is we've got the most diverse cabinet, uh, we have an Asian prime minister, and I think that will really frustrate a lot of people who are offended by those comments, particularly black women, because having an Asian prime minister is actually not an excuse for not acting on racism against black people, black women. And actually, it's, it's, you can't use that as a kind of get out of jail free card. It is separate and it is a fantastic thing that we should celebrate, but nonetheless, it doesn't excuse or kind of uh, mean that you can brush things to the side. Well, I mean, I totally agree with that and I uh, nipped that in the bud when mm. he was trying to make that argument. Yeah. Interesting that we, we heard that from, from Mel Stride and Graham Street yesterday as well, yeah. to se celebrate that we have a, a Hindu prime minister. It does minister. a lot of heavy lifting I mean, conversations yeah, like this. It's interesting, <laughs> though, because I, I, I don't think, to, to be fair to him, he expressly stated that Frank Hest is not racist. No. He, he sort of made the assumption and, and obviously deferred the conclusion. Mm. I, I also, on the basis that he's not a racist, yes, I think he's saying, provided he's not a racist. And I, and I just think, for me, that brings up the mm. question of, 
the extent to which you can do something wrong, in this instance it's to say something racist, and apologise for it, and it kind of draw a line un under the debate? I mean, clearly in politics and in media we're going to still focus on and talk about it, particularly when you've taken a whole day mm -hmm. to even acknowledge it in, in the first place. But, it, but it's an interesting kind of question as to whether that is sufficient. I mean, we are, though, in a PR game in <laughs> politics. Uh, and that does make you think you've got to go a lot further than, than just accept an apology oh. as being uh, as being sufficient, Absolutely. even if that would have been acceptable, you know, in the first place. But then on the other side of the argument, there'll be a lot of black women going into work today traumatised by those comments, and it will take a lot of work from the Conservative Party to, to win those women back, for those women to feel comfortable with the Conservative Party, Mari. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think this is the difficulty with allowing that vacuum to kind of swallow up uh, all, all that time that was wasted, really, by government ministers faffing about and trying to claim it wasn't anything mm. to do with gender or race. That was all a waste of time. And actually nipping this in the bud would have been a much better political strategy um, for the Prime Minister. But here we are. <laughs> we will get uh, Jonathan Ashworth's uh, response from Labour at ten past eight. For now, Mari, great stuff. Thank you. Time for the other top stories, Leah. Thanks so much, Wilfred. Uh, yeah, those top stories then. A government minister has told this programme that the Conservative Party is happy to spend money donated by businessman Frank Hester on the basis that he is not a racist. The Prime Minister said yesterday that Mr Hester's comments, uh, that seeing the MP, Diane Abbott, made him want to hate all black women, uh, were racist and wrong. In the last half hour... Uh, economic growth figures for January were published, showing that GDP rose by 0.2% in January. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, said today's numbers show we're making progress in growing the economy. A Sky News investigation has found hundreds of children are using catapults to kill and torture animals before sharing the images on WhatsApp. Uh, the government is introducing promised legislation to quash the wrongful convictions of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. The Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollingrake, has told this programme it's great news for innocent branch managers. Yeah, I'm going to pick up uh, exactly there. Thank you. Uh, I'm joined here uh, by the lawyer, David Enright, who's a partner at uh, Howe and Co Solicitors, who are representing over... 200 individual sub-postmasters and their families whose lives have been affected by this scandal. David, uh, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. How significant is the development today? Is it what the families you represent mm -hmm. have been waiting for? Well, we represent uh, almost 300 postmasters across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And I've almost uh, worn a groove in your sofa coming on here to talk about this announcement. We've had it three times since the 9th of January. Now, Kevin Hollingrake has a good reputation as someone who's wanting to drive things through, but uh, he's not on his own in this. Um, he did, I must call him out, he, he said the government was acting very swiftly, but that, that can't be right, because this scandal has been going on for 26 years. I myself and my firm have been working on this since 2012. Uh, people can't live on hope. Um, they hope to enact legislation uh, by July, uh, but we've had these false dawns many, many times. Uh, I've been receiving messages and calls from right across the United Kingdom, including from people in Northern Ireland and Scotland who will not benefit from any of this. Now, this is a national scandal, and we need a national response. OK, so but just park that, the, the national debate in terms of what Kevin Hollerake uh, and his department are announcing today and what he came on to, to announce. What is new in that? Or, or do you think none of it's new? Um, a part of it is not new, in that um, Rishi Sunak announced this on the 9th of uh, January, and we heard it again from Kevin on the 23rd of uh, February. Uh, the government are proposing this truly unprecedented step in parliamentary and legal history to quash uh, 983 convictions. Uh, they, they hope to enact this by July, um, but we can't eat hope. Uh, so, and as Kevin said, you can't get any compensation until you are identified, vindicated and compensated. Now, what are we going to do for the very many people who died waiting, the people who died with their mm -hmm. reputation sullied? For example, a client of mine, Peter Holmes, a police officer who went on in retirement to be a, a postmaster, he died five years before his conviction was quashed. So there are Peters and Patricias right across the United Kingdom we need to identify their families, their widows, their widowers, and tell them that your loved one was innocent. Do you, I couldn't, I mean, that 
I couldn't agree more in, in terms of those uh, details and those individual examples. In, in terms of your hopes and expectations for when for the other vast majority of the 300 people you represent, a, a line will be drawn under this. Is, is that elevated today? Do you have a date in mind off the back of this announcement or is it the same as we were last week? Mm. Well, there's two points there. First of all, you can't draw a line under um, having lost, say, 20 years of your life. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, we want this to happen as quickly as possible. As Alan Bates said, get on and do it. Get on and do it. So, we've had the announcement today. Um, the government appear to be laying legislation before Parliament uh, today. It will still have to have three readings in the House of Commons, three readings in the House of Lords, plus the committee stages. So, we're a long way from done. So, you, all of us, need to keep on top of the government and drive this through to get justice for these decent people. No, no doubt about that, and the parliamentary process is, is slow, as we know, for, for, for lots of things. You said it's a sort of pretty seminal piece of legislation to overturn things, so it has to go through those processes. It, if this does all pass, though, and by uh, the summertime it, it, is, it is a law, is that a moment of relative to the fact that you can't get 20 years back of relative celebration for your clients that they've been waiting for? Well, you see, we've had an awful lot of false dawns. Uh, and the devil, or indeed some, sometimes people say God, is in the detail. We want to know what the fine detail is. How will this actually work? How will we identify these people who are in every single community across England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland to get their cases quashed and then to move them swiftly towards compensation so they can move on with their lives? I want to know the detail. OK, David, thanks so much for joining us and uh, I'm sure we'll have you back to, to go through that detail when we have it. Much appreciated, David Enright. Now, Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan have spoken out against the decision to allow their extradition to the UK from Romania. Bedfordshire Police said officers had obtained a European arrest warrant for the two men as part of an ongoing investigation into allegations of rape and human trafficking. This guy's Becky Cottrell is uh, in Bucharest uh, for us this morning. Becky, uh, talk us through the, the latest after these, uh, this extradition uh, decision came across yesterday. Yeah, well, it only came to light yesterday that Bedfordshire Police are investigating these allegations. At this stage, we don't know much more other than, as you mentioned, that they relate to allegations of rape and human trafficking. After securing that European arrest warrant, it was up to a judge in Romania to decide whether the brothers could be extradited to the UK. That judge ruled that they can be, but only after legal proceedings have wrapped up here in Romania. Now, in Romania, the brothers are fighting charges of human trafficking and setting up an organised criminal group. And Andrew Tate is also accused of rape. It's really not clear how long, though, those legal proceedings could take in Romania. The brothers deny all of the charges and have said that this is all part of a conspiracy to bring the two of them down. They also said that they don't oppose returning to the UK, but they want to uh, fight these charges here first, face the legal system and prove their innocence. And yesterday, Andrew Tate talked about looking forward to a time that he would receive an apology from the media for reporting these allegations. Now, they aren't in custody in Romania. They returned back home here after appearing in court, but they aren't allowed to leave the country. Becky, thanks so much. Becky Cottrell there for us live in Bucharest this morning. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show, we will be speaking to the award-winning photographers who took these stunning pictures. We'll be right back. Grand 40th anniversary. I can't believe that I co-founded it 40 years ago with my mum, Virginia McKenna, and my dad, Bill Travers. And, and what a great way to, to celebrate with these two young lions, Zar and Jamil. They, as you rightly say, they came from a, a zoo, but actually from a, an ostrich farm. And it was Ukrainian animal activists who first alerted everyone to the situation managed to get the, the animals away from the ostrich farm and via various route through Poland and then uh, into Belgium to a halfway house. And then we've been able, with the help of incredible people, you know, British Airways Holidays, uh, Cargo Lux, DHL, our team at Shamwari in South Africa, it's, it's been an incredible team effort. 
to get them to South Africa, where they will live the rest of their lives. It's not complete freedom. It can never be complete freedom. These animals have been in captivity uh, too long, and it would be too difficult and too dangerous to return them fully to the wild. But they will have a life worth living. The lions do need all sorts of paperwork. In fact, it's one of the biggest challenges that, that anyone who moves uh, animals from one country to another, wild animals from one country to another, especially when it's difficult to get the original paperwork when you have a country like Ukraine, which was face, which is facing so many challenges. You have to have the export paperwork, the health paperwork, the veterinary paperwork to get them out of the country. And then you have to have the reciprocal paperwork in South Africa and hats off to both the Ukrainian and the South African authorities for expediting the paperwork to allow this move to go ahead, because without it, it can't. Well, they will have an enclosure. It'll be about the size of a football field. It's natural uh, South African bush, which uh, at least ancestrally, they would have evolved to live in. Uh, they'll be looked after 365 days a year. We have a, an incredible expert team down there led by Glenn and Catherine and Dr. Johan Joubert, who is a, a world-renowned veterinarian, uh, along with the other big cats that we've rescued, and they will have a quality of life. Welcome back. Well, the Sony World Photography Competition has announced its category winners, recognizing the best single images from across the world last year. Over 395,000 images from over 200 countries and territories were submitted. I'm pleased to say two of the category winners are able to join us this morning. Michelle Sank uh, won the Portrait Category of the Year. And Liam Mann uh, won the uh, landscape category, and both are, are with us. Uh, very good morning to you guys. Congratulations. <laughs> um, why don't we bring up each of your respective photos and, and talk them through them one at a time. So, Michelle, uh, f firstly, talk, talk us through this picture of yours that, uh, that won you the award. Um, this was taken at the uh, pavilion um, in Seapoint, an area where I grew up as a child. Um, which I've returned to in the last couple of years to make work there. And what's extraordinary about this uh, post-apartheid is the multiculturalism that is now there and the fact that this pool has not changed at all in all these years. So quite remarkable. Yeah. It's, a, it's fantastic. And congrats on the win. And Liam, talk us through your, your great snap. Yep. So this is a photo that I took um, on one night in the Isle of Skye, Scotland. It's one of the most beautiful landscapes that I know. It's the Old Man of Stor, amazing rock formations. And uh, I use some uh, drones with lights attached to them to light up the landscape. In the background, you can see what actually looks like a sunrise. Um, that's the moon. So um, about half an hour before I took this image, this huge blizzard blew through and all the ice crystals in the air, they kind of refract the light in the same way that the atmosphere refracts the light during a sunrise. So it gave the moon this kind of brilliant orange glow. Uh, Liam, absolutely stunning. Uh, Michelle, can we go back to your picture very quickly? Because I just wonder, can you talk us through how quick you managed to capture that image? Because I have to say, it looks like the front cover of Vogue or something. It's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I work very intuitively and, and very spontaneously and, and um, something sparks a kind of awe in me when I'm, I'm working in this place and, and I saw them sitting there and, and just asked if I could photograph them. So my relationship is very symbiotic. It's, it's about me um, negotiating with them. There's an intimacy that I think comes through in, in, in my subjects with myself. And that's extremely important to me, um, that it's almost like an act of love when, when I see the image that I want to take um, and the kind of tableau that, that can be created. It's, it's 
very, very life affirming for me. Liam, I'm, I'm, by the way, I don't think when Leah was focusing on Michelle and how long it took, it was a suggestion that yours was very quick, <laughs> quick and easy uh, picture to, to capture. But, but talk us through the, the planning, in fact, that goes into to something like this. I mean, did you know for a long time you wanted to, to get up to there and, and take this sort of photo? How long did you have to spend that evening or was it weeks in, in, in the making? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been trying to get this photo for years. Um, like I said, it's one of my favourite places. And my goal was to showcase this place in a completely new way that uh, other people haven't seen. Um, it's quite popular on social media. You know, landscape photographers around the world come and photograph it. So, yeah, just trying to put my own spin on it. Um, so I did have this idea for a long time of um, light painting the rocks at night. And I've always loved snow. I love the way it simplifies an image. So um, it was last winter, um, pretty late in the season, around February and March. And there was just this freak snowstorm. Um, and I think I had maybe two nights to get the photo uh, before it all melted. I drove up, uh, first night, total failure, uh, whiteout, couldn't, couldn't photograph at all. Uh, second night, I woke up, at, I think 12, like midnight, uh, looked outside again, total whiteout, but like I said, it was my last chance. So I made the hike up anyway. It's usually a one and a half hour hike, but because of the whiteout, it ended up taking around four hours. Um, and I went the wrong way, went up the side of the mountain, got lost. Yeah, just extremely difficult. Uh, when I finally made it, yes. Uh, yeah. So when I finally made it up to the, um, the shooting location, uh, yeah, still terrible conditions. But after about an hour, just the conditions just totally cleared up and I, I got the kind of amazing image that you see now. The dedication was so worth it. It looks like a painted portrait. I wonder, Liam, your thoughts um, around people being amateur photographers, you know, the introduction of the smartphone, because capturing what you did would have taken some, I imagine, some quite expensive... Kit, but what's your thoughts on you know everyone snapping away, ca capturing moments on on smartphones? I think it's great. I mean, it's it's amazing to share wherever you are to kind of create and be part of that process, and you can absolutely do that with a smartphone. Um, for me, the images that I'm creating, I do need a certain type of gear um, that allows me to create those images, but. I started somewhere. I started, you know, 10, 15 years ago on my phone with a point and shoot camera, and I was not taking the images that I took now back then. So for anyone who's like just using their phone or getting into photography, uh, absolutely go for it. Just, you know, keep your sights set on the direction you want to take your photography. Um, just to round things off, guys, I, I, I was interested if I could get your take, not specifically at all on the photograph or the story that has uh, dominated things at the start of the week with the Princess of Wales, but just on the principles, Michelle, um, about what is standard uh, for expert photographers in terms of touching up or uh, minor edits uh, to a photograph and, and what becomes fundamentally altering uh, the, the photograph that you took. Do, do you do little sub-edits and, and alter the shades and lighting and things like that with most photographs or not? Yes, I do. And I think it, it just um, resembles what we used to do in the dark room. You know, you could spend a whole day with one image, lightening certain areas, darkening certain areas. And, you know, I teach photography now as well on, on a master's program. And, and I feel very much that digital construction is is similar to historical painting in a way where people created an amended reality. So um, I think, yeah, it has a place for me as well in, in contemporary photography. Um, Liam, just quickly, your, your take on that. I know we lost you for a moment. Uh, do you think a little bit of editing is OK or, or only if it's shades and colours? Um, yeah, so I think editing is fine. For me personally, I try and keep things as authentic to the kind of uh, the location, the feeling that I'm getting at the moment. So I don't sky replace. I don't try and 
uh, manipulate the image to kind of, uh, I would say, uh, confuse the viewer and give a false interpretation. So yeah, I, like in the same way that with my image, I'm using physical drones to paint the landscape. I'm not doing that in the editing room. I'm trying to keep things as authentic as possible. Guys, thanks so much for joining us this morning uh, and congratulations, Michelle and Liam. Thank you, thank you. Now, uh, do you have a long beard, facial piercings or tattoos or brightly coloured mohawks? <laughs> Is that meant to be plural or singular? Can you have more than one mohawk? I don't know. Uh, well, if so, uh, you're needed for a good cause. People with distinctive characteristics are being urged to come forward to help train future guide dogs. Research by the charity has uh, revealed almost two-thirds of dogs react with fear or confusion to attributes they have not been exposed to before. Quite extraordinary, <laughs> this, isn't it? Yeah, well, I have a tattoo, but it's very small. Don't know how useful it would be. Um, well, yeah, I, maybe that's not... Mohawks, I can't offer up um, any of these. Guys, <laughs> uh, back in back in some tragic years of my youth, some bad haircuts. Well, this is probably quite bad, but I not a mohawk. Ever. <laughs> never, never a mohawk, never a mohawk. <laughs> I did have a ponytail once, believe it or not. But but uh, quite, quite uh, an interesting aspect to this, just to try and get all the dogs very used to everything. Yeah. I mean, I think it's true of in life in, in general, to be mm. honest. I think the more you're exposed mm. to in terms of difference and, uh, you know, different people looking different ways, the less you're afraid of new things. And I think that goes for dogs too. Mm. So the, it makes sense. The other takeaway from at least the photographs is uh, it gives you an excuse to have a cuddle with a puppy. Yes. So, uh, yes, please. Might grow a beard just for that. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, all they have to do is nip down to Camden Market in London yeah. and they'd find all sorts, you know? Well, we, we have uh, lots more sort of come here on The Breakfast Show. We're going to take a very quick break. Uh, but, of course, at the top of the hour, we will be back uh, with uh, all of the day's main headlines and reaction uh, to the news from the government minister that uh, provided uh, that uh, Mr Hester is not racist, despite his comments that he's apologised for the Conservative Party, is happy to spend his money. We'll be right back.
Good morning to you. It is eight o'clock on today's show. Rishi Sunak condemns comments by his party's biggest donor as racist, but a minister tells this program they're still happy to take his money. Well, what is it really like to be an MP? Well, we've spent the day with a politician who says that she constantly has to think about her safety. Plus, a call goes out for people with tattoos and beards to help train guide dogs. We'll tell you why. It is Wednesday, the 13th of March, and here are your headlines. A Conservative minister tells Sky News the party's happy to spend millions of pounds given by a major donor accused of racist comments. Is the party content to spend his money? He, well, it, it, on the basis he's not a racist and has apologised for what he said, yes. With MPs' safety in the spotlight, we have the story of Zara Sultana, the youngest Muslim MP ever elected in the UK and now the most threatened. Someone who said, you need to be deported, you <laughs> send that <laughs> to Palestine, they are low on targets. A Sky News investigation finds hundreds of children using catapults to kill and torture animals before sharing sick images on WhatsApp. The government say legislation to quash the convictions of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal as good news for thousands of people. And pictures of perfection captured on camera will bring you the images that won the Sony World Photography Competition. A very good morning uh, to you. A Conservative minister to, uh, has told this programme that the party is happy to spend money from a major party donor who made comments described by Rishi Sunak as racist and wrong. Frank Hester, who gave £10 million to the Conservatives last year, apologised for saying MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. The Metropolitan Police have now confirmed that they've been contacted about the incident, which comes while there are rising concerns over extremist language and threats to MPs. Uh, here was uh, Kevin Hollenrake uh, with me last hour. I'm not excusing it at all. Uh, these comments are wrong. Racist is apologised. That's not, that's not excusing his comments. No, no, I agree, but I'm asking the question. Is the party content to spend his money? He, well, it, it, on the basis he's not a racist and has apologised for what he said, yes. yes. Well, Mari's uh, joined me here on set. And, uh, Mari, th there's a lot of factors to this, and, and perhaps most notable is that the acceptance that these comments were racist and wrong took most of yesterday uh, for certainly the Prime Minister to, to concur with and, and thus the Minister this morning to do so. The question today was always going to be, as in part it was yesterday, should they still keep this money or return it? We've got a pretty definitive answer this morning. Yeah, absolutely. So Kevin Hollenrake, uh, very clear that they are happy to keep that money, happy to spend that money. Uh, the Labour Party, I'm sure, will tell you when you speak to them later on this morning, Wilf, uh, that they still believe that money should be returned and that they shouldn't accept money from people who have those views. That is a debate that will continue to rumble on. But I think, as you say, the interesting factor is really the timeline. So for viewers who maybe weren't paying attention yesterday, let me take you through how this happened. So. The allegations emerged uh, in The Guardian uh, on Monday evening. The Conservative Party spokesperson then issued a statement saying that the comments were not linked to race or gender. Then we had Graham Stewart yesterday on Sky News say that the party welcomed the money from anyone who wanted to support the Conservative Party, including, therefore, uh, Frank Hester, uh, but wouldn't say whether the comments were racist. He did condemn the comments. He yes. condemned the comments. He absolutely did condemn the comments. We then had Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, come out and double down and say these comments were nothing to do with race and gender. We then had the Prime Minister's spokesperson refuse to say whether those comments were racist. We then had Kemi Badenoch make the first move when it comes to uh, big political uh, cabinet ministers. She came out about 4.30 yesterday and said these comments are racist and broke ranks. Then, about two and a half hours later, at 7 o'clock, the Prime Minister finally some would say, appeared to be bounced into agreeing that the comments were racist. So this whole thing took a lot longer than it needed to. 
And now the question, as you say, is should the money be given back or, as Marcus Fish, Tory MP, suggested, should Frank Hester donate another 10 million to good causes like, for instance, disadvantaged young people? This is all kind of the background of what's going on. And then we obviously have the conversation that is continuing and it's been continuing for weeks about MP safety and extremism and extremist values and extremist language. And that's also why this is all connected as well, because we have this government crackdown on extremism. Well, well let's get a little bit more context before we pick up the conversation again on uh, the moment at which these comments have been uh, so elevated. And it comes, of course, uh, at a time of growing threats towards MPs. And uh, throughout the day uh, yesterday, our political uh, correspondent, Serena Barker Singh, uh, spent the day uh, with Coventry MP Zara Sultana, uh, who is the youngest uh, elected uh, female Muslim MP and is now the most threatened. Zara Sultana. Recording the time and the location on a constituency visit, this is one of the many security precautions this Labour MP has to take before every single event. This year, she's found out that she's received the most threats and serious abuse of any MP online, 68% more than the next most targeted MP. She says a notable uptick since speaking up about the rights of the Palestinian people. What do you get online? I'll, I'll start off with someone who said, you need to be deported, you Send that to Palestine, they are low on targets. Just going to speak MPs' duties have become more risky for members under threat. In the back of minds are the two MPs killed in their constituencies. House conventions have also been upended by safety concerns. Parliamentary authorities know safety is fundamental to democracy and offer a number of security measures for members. Door knocking can be one of the most exposing moments for an MP. For Zara, she says the majority of her abuse, 54%, has been categorised as Islamophobic. I think the Prime Minister has used his platform to whip up fear, hate and Islamophobia. And that is incredibly dangerous. The Prime Minister disputes this, saying he has called out Islamists and the far right, but expressed concern about protests like this one. Zara says it's vital she attends these demonstrations to represent her constituents and community. The more you're in the public sphere, it feels like the more you're being attacked. It weighs heavily. Um, it's difficult, but I remind myself why I, why I got involved in politics in the first place. and. I'm reminded about all of these values that I have that I share with millions of other people across the country. Zara says she will now increase her security measures. For some MPs, though, the risks are still too high and said they have had no choice but to step down before the next general election. Serena Buck Singh, Sky News. Mari, that's obviously one big area for the context of, of all of this debate and, and MP safety. The, the other one, which you already alluded to, is that we are literally waiting this week for the government's new definition of extremism. Yes. Uh, which puts every reason to, to hold the government to account, to call something uh, either it is or it isn't, uh, when we get these comments. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing, is the government are really keen to talk about extremism and they're really keen to talk about how we define extremism and how we crack down on extremism. And extremism can come in lots of different shapes and sizes and therefore many would argue that comments that were made about Diana but were extremist comments. And this is where things start to get a little bit murky for the government because it's a conversation that they are very willing and keen to have as what they like to call themselves the party that's tough on law and order. But obviously sometimes those conversations can become uncomfortable if those kinds of views are ex expressed by perhaps people who donate a lot of money. Mari, great stuff as always. Uh, no doubt we'll be uh, chatting again shortly after we've uh, interviewed uh, Labour, which is uh, coming up in about five or ten minutes' time. John Ashworth uh, will be responding to the government today for us. Now, growth has returned to the UK economy, as new figures out this morning suggested a 0.2% boost in January. Our business presenter, Ian King, is in the city and joins me now with the context... Ian, this is sort of in line with what experts were thinking would happen for this month uh, of January. What is it relative to, to the, the last couple of months that we just had and what does it mean in terms of uh, the status of the economy right now? 
Well, obviously, Will, for, for the final uh, half of uh, last year, the UK entered a technical recession defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. It was really a very, very shallow recession indeed. The UK economy contracted by 0.1% uh, in the third quarter of last year and 0.3% in the final quarter of last year. Those numbers uh, could be, well be prone to revision. So uh, this uh, so-called recession may be revised out of uh, the history books altogether eventually. But uh, one can definitively say that the UK economy returned to to growth in January, 0.2%, uh, uh, reasonably respectable showing. And with most economists expecting growth in February as well, I think we can pretty definitively say that the UK economy will have grown during the first three months of this year. So such as uh, there was a recession at the tail end of last year, it looks to have been a very, very short and very, very shallow recession and really not in uh, uh, out of kilter with what we've seen uh, elsewhere on uh, continental Europe, for example. In terms of what happened in January, well, it was driven by a couple of factors. Uh, retail sales uh, were surprisingly uh, strong in January and customer facing uh, activities more generally. So the services sector was responsible for the majority of uh, growth seen in January. No surprise there given that that constitutes uh, around four fifths of GDP. But uh, also to the upside was uh, the construction sector. House building activity had a, had a pretty decent month in January and that contributed to growth as well. To the downside, production outputs are uh, contracted. But even there, there were uh, glimmers of hope. Manufacturing activity relatively positive as well. Now, as you say, uh, this uh, was bang in line with uh, market expectations. Uh, Sterling and uh, the gilt market have, have barely moved on uh, these numbers. I think the government will take um, some comfort from these numbers, though. They, they do show uh, if there was a recession at the end of last year, we're probably almost certainly out of it by now. Uh, Ian King, great stuff. Thanks so much for that. Uh, we'll have a, a deeper chat with Ian a bit later in the show as well uh, for the significance of this moving forward. Uh, Liv, time for all the other headlines now. Yeah, it's almost official. Joe Biden and Donald Trump will face each other in November's US election. President Joe Biden former president Donald Trump, have secured enough delegates to win their party's presidential nominations. That's after primaries in Georgia, Mississippi and Washington and Hawaii's Republican caucuses. Ukraine has launched a series of drone attacks on Russia for the second night in a row, again targeting energy facilities. 58 drones were shot down overnight, according to the Russian Defence Ministry. The overnight attacks on Tuesday hit oil sites deep inside Russia, including the Nizhny Novgorod region. Meanwhile, Russia claims to have killed 234 fighters, stopping an incursion from across its border with Ukraine. Soldiers who... Ukraine say are Russian volunteers fighting for Kyiv claim to have entered into Russia's Kirks and Belgorod region. In a statement, the Russian Defence Ministry blamed the attack on the Kyiv regime, also saying they destroyed seven tanks and five armoured vehicles. The government is introducing its promised legislation to quash wrongful convictions for hundreds of sub-postmasters caught up in the post office scandal. Well, the new law will exonerate most of those convicted in England and Wales in what has been branded the biggest miscarriage of justice in British legal history. Those postmasters who were affected will receive an interim compensation payment with an option of immediately taking a fixed and final offer of £600,000. Earlier, we spoke to David Inwright, who's a solicitor representing sub-postmasters. I've almost uh, worn a groove in your sofa coming on here to talk about this announcement. We've had it three times since the 9th of January. Now, Kevin Hollingry has a good reputation as someone who's wanting to drive things through, but uh, he's not on his own in this. Um, he did, I must call him out, he, he said the government was acting very swiftly, but that, that can't be right, because this scandal has been going on for 26 years. Just a quick question. Do you have a beard, facial piercings, tattoos or a brightly coloured mohawk? And if so, well, you're going to be in high demand. That's because research by the charity Guide Dogs has revealed almost two thirds of dogs have reacted with a fear or confusion to attributes they've not been exposed to before. And now puppies are experiencing all types of human styles to set them up for their future jobs. There we go. Some uh, lovely looking puppies there, aren't oh, they? Yeah. Uh, Leah, thank you. Uh, Sky News uh, can reveal that children are filming themselves using catapults to kill and torture animals in a UK-wide network on WhatsApp. 
uh, quite the about turn of uh, animal stories there. Our uh, correspondent, Amelia Harper, uh, joins us now for, for more on this quite uh, unbelievable story, Amelia. It's abhorrent, the footage that you're about to see. This is a long-running investigation into a UK-wide network of animal shooting, killing and torture perpetrated by children. Uh, as part of this, I've had to review over 350 pieces of material depicting animal abuse, animal torture and dead animals as well. And a, a warning that my report does contain distressing uh, imagery from the start. Darkness has fallen. This, the setting for an execution. A bird singled out, about to be shot by children. The impact of the fall minor compared to the incoming kick. And this is the weapon of choice, a catapult. The victim this time, a squirrel. Sky News has uncovered a UK-wide network of animal shooting and torture carried out by children using catapults. Filming and photographing their kills, this material is shared on WhatsApp against their terms of use. An investigation has uncovered 11 catapult groups on the app with nearly 500 members like this one. We're seeing more and more injured animals being reported to us that have been hit by a catapult. You can go and buy a catapult very easily and use it to target animals, which is illegal and offences will be committed. And injured animals end up here. The Swan Sanctuary, which rescues waterfowl, has 20 birds, all with catapult injuries, in their hospital pens. Most of the injuries are head injuries, neck injuries, pure kill shots. They're there to try and kill these animals. Fractures to the facial areas, eyes exploding, uh, windpipes bursting. Yeah, it's, that's all I've got. Causing unnecessary suffering to an animal is illegal, but when it comes to catapults, there's a gap in the law. People can buy them, carry them, and here they're being used to kill. The Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 is the relevant legislation protecting wildlife in England and Wales, but catapults aren't covered anywhere under those laws. Henry Smith is part of a group of MPs working to lift animal welfare standards. Government uh, and Parliament should look to legislate in terms of the sale of catapults and also for those who use catapults as a weapon to inflict injury and suffering, uh, that there is a criminal sanction to that. Big Canadian goose, dead as a dodo. Documented on WhatsApp, this rabbit just another victim of an emerging trend where catapults are used by children to kill. Calls have been made to tighten the laws. The question is, will it stop them? Do laws need to be tightened for this to be stopped? Yeah, that's right. Well, there is a hole in the law, which I think we have exposed through this investigation, because under the Wildlife and Countryside <laughs> Act 1981, it lists the, the weapons that you um, could use to kill, uh, that's prohibited, excuse me, from killing an animal. And catapults are not on that list. And this loophole is allowing children, uh, they're exploiting the fact that these are not classed as illegal weapons to use them to kill animals. This is being done for fun. There is no reason uh, that allows them to do this to animals in the law. Causing unnecessary suffering to an animal is illegal under the Animal Welfare Act 2006. And you can see the impact that it's having on volunteers who are having to go out and deal with these animals that are injured. Danny Rogers there was quite emotional uh, in our piece, but we'll have more on this uh, throughout the day. Amelia, uh, amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Amelia Harper. Um, we're going to have a very quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The rest of the week will stay unsettled with localised flooding, but southwesterly winds mean it'll be very mild. Uh, rain will continue to clear to northern parts of the UK this morning, uh, while lingering across northern England, North Wales and much of Ireland. To the south, it'll be mainly dry, but there'll be plenty of cloud around, which will bring some light rain to the hills. Scotland and North West Ireland can expect some sunshine. That's your weather. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
I'm joined now by uh, Labour's uh, Jonathan Ashworth, the Shadow Paymaster uh, General, to discuss uh, all of the day's uh, news. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining good us. Good morning. Um, wanted to start on the, the dispute that sort of erupted yesterday uh, in and around uh, Frank Hester's mm. comments, the Tory party donor. Um, the Prime Minister obviously acknowledged by late yesterday afternoon that the comments were, were racist. What was your take on how long it took to, to get to that point and how things unfolded? I mean, I thought it was absolutely staggering it took Rishi Sunak, what, 24 hours to condemn these racist, reprehensible comments about Diane Abbott. Um, I think that shows how weak Rishi Sunak is, because you'll remember a couple of weeks ago it took him a while to take on now the reform MP, Lee Anderson, for those Islamophobic comments. He should have been out there condemning these comments immediately, but fundamentally he's taken £10 million from this individual. Every Tory MP and candidate handing out leaflets, paying for Facebook advertising, it's funded by this £10 million from the, this individual who's made these deeply, deeply racist, offensive comments. If Rishi Sunak had anything about him, if he had any backbone, he would pay that money back today. But actually, you've had a Conservative minister on the BBC just a few moments ago saying they would take another £10 million from this individual. I think that just shows you how weak and how desperate the Tory party have become under Rishi Sunak. Would Labour return the money in the same circumstances? Well, we wouldn't. Well, of course. We most certainly would not be taking money from an individual who has expressed his opinions in this way. It's not just the comments about Diane Abbott. He's in the newspapers today. Apparently, he's also said some very offensive comments about people from uh, Indian heritage. I mean, this is absolutely astonishing that Rishi Sunak won't pay this £10 million back. Um, Kevin Honorate was on with us earlier, uh, and I asked him uh, whether they were happy to spend the money. His answer was to say, on the basis that he's not racist, uh, that we would be happy to continue to spend the money. I guess my question there is, is it possible for someone to say something wrong, do something wrong, as wrong as, as racism is? Words which the public get so fed up of. At the end of the day, Kevin Holland is going to be putting out leaflets in his North Yorkshire constituency, paid by this individual who's made these deeply, deeply offensive, reprehensible remarks about Diane Abbott and people of Indian heritage. The decent thing, the right thing, would be to pay this money back. Do they, are they really that desperate for their, their leaflets in an election campaign that they need this man's money? I mean, come on, they should pay the money back. That's the right thing to do. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to step back a little bit, because particularly in your first answer there, you, you condemned the time it took for the Conservatives mm. to act. Is it a bit rich for Labour to, to do that when, with the issues around uh, Azhar Ali, it took uh, two and a half days for him to be removed as the, as the Labour candidate? In fact, a couple of your colleagues, Pat McFadden and Nick Thomas-Simmons, came on to Sky's Air on the, the Sunday and the Monday, respectively, if I remember, um, to, to try and explain why it was still OK that he was a candidate. I, I just wonder whether both parties should be stepping back uh, and together calling out extremism when it happens and not politicising it, which is clearly happening somewhat here. But in the, in the instance of the Rochdale, we did suspend him, and actually that meant we had no Labour candidate I, I know, in, the, but your in that by-election. With all due respect, your first answer specifically said that Conservatives took too long here. Mm. I mean, it's fair to say that Labour took too long to, to suspend that candidate as well. But there was, for the comments, an immediate apology, but then subsequent comments emerged from that individual. But we took a decision, we withdrew a Labour candidate, which has a political implication for us. The Conservative Party here are refusing to take a decision which has a political implication for them, i.e. hand the £10 million back. So I do think it's a different, a different scenario. Could, could both parties step away from the politicisation of this? I think when you confront racism, Islamophobia in society, anti-Semitism, I think you have to challenge it, whether that is uh, difficult for your party or not. We've done a lot in the Labour Party to change the Labour Party under Keir Starmer's leadership to deal with the problems that we had with anti-Semitism. That took leadership, that took a strong approach from Keir Starmer, but Rishi Sunak's not doing the same, is he? He dilly-dallied around Lee Anderson and his Islamophobic remarks. He dilly-dallied on this thing. And I think in the end it's because he's so weak. Look, you only need to go over there. You can talk to Tory MPs mm. who are questioning whether Rishi Sunak can continue in power uh, or not, whether his time is up. We know he's overseeing an absolutely chaotic party and he's struggling to get a grip and he's not in control of events. But he should, when he's confronted with racism, do the decent thing 
and hand this money back. Of course, many would uh, say the actions around Desiree Lee didn't show strong leadership, at least for the first couple of days when he was maintained um, as a candidate. Um, want, wanted to move on um, and touch on the announcement today from the government around postmasters. Mm -hmm. Just the fundamental principle here that is, is now going to be uh, enacted into law of overturning the judiciary with legislation, is that something that you think the government is right to go as far to do and that Labour will uphold? Um, and how does Labour consider whether that should ever be done again? Well, it's a very particular set of circumstances because of this long miscarriage of justice and the way in which our sub-postmasters uh, were treated. Um, so we do welcome what, is, uh, what has been announced. We hope this legislation can proceed uh, at a reasonable pace. Of course, we also want to see appropriate compensation paid. I, look, I think, like you, I'm sure you watched the documentary, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, the drama, like we all did, and was completely moved and angered by it. We really have got to deliver justice for the sub-postmasters. Um, last time you were on, you were only here just last week uh, with, with I was. Pay, and you I'm struck a, a bet. I'm a regular uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> on this stool. You, you struck a £10 bet about when the election's yeah. going to be. Are you, are you getting a bit hot under the collar there? We're getting closer to the deadline for which a May election would have to be called? Are you a betting man? Uh, I'll do another £10 <laughs> for charity. Do you want to double down? Oh, uh, yeah, it's for the National Association of Children of Alcoholics Charity. So, okay. yeah. But I think there's a serious point, because last week... The Conservatives just announced a big £46 billion unfunded tax change, right? So that suggests to me they're preparing for an election. I think it was, but, it was a long-term goal. But they need to tell us where the money is coming from to fund that. Is it going to come from borrowing? Is this a repeat of the Liz Trust shambles? Or is it going to come from pensioners? Because if you sever the link between the national insurance contributions and the state pension, how do you qualify for your pension? So today we're going to be putting this proposal under scrutiny and I think the state pension, as we know it, is in peril with the proposals the Conservatives are putting forward on that unfunded £46 billion. So I do think an election is coming, and I think we'll be asking serious... Or the British public and pensioners will be asking serious questions of Rishi Sunak on his £46 billion unfunded plan. A long-term goal, I think, as, as they would frame it, but uh, understand, it. understand your framing. Jonathan Ashworth, thanks so much for joining us. Now, a long-time aide to the late Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has been attacked in the Lithuanian capital Vilnius. Uh, Leonid Volkov uh, described the incident as a typical gangster greeting from President Putin. They wanted to make a chop out of me with a natural chop hammer. A man right outside my house, in the yard, attacked me and hit me in the leg 15 times. For some reason, the leg remained intact. It hurts to walk, but they say there is no fracture. But he broke my arm. Well, listen, it'll cure. The main thing is that we will work and we will not give up. I'm not ready to give any comments yet. Besides, it's obvious that this was such an obvious, typical, characteristic gangster greeting from Putin, from gangster St. Petersburg. Our international correspondent, Diana Magne, is here with me now. Diana, give us some context. Who, who is this gentleman? So he used to run the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which was Alexei Navalny's foundation in Russia, exiled from Russia um, towards the beginning of the war, uh, because Putin simply doesn't want them there. Um, and they have been uh, very much at risk wherever they are, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's not ex unexpected that this would happen. Um, and for a long time, they haven't said where their headquarters are. Leonid Volkov doesn't actually run it anymore. But it's not surprising that he would be a target. And a group called Male State, which is this sort of patriarchal, far-right nationalist group in Russia, declared extremist but their followers have already said that they're responsible. And whether that was from inside Russia, whether they have proxies in Lithuania, we don't know. But, um, you know, they, they, they are acting on behalf of the Russian state. And, and how worrying is it or how striking is it that these sorts of things take place in, in outside of Russia's borders? Is, is that kind of sadly to, to be expected or is it a big surprise? I think to people who are considered Russia's enemies, then um, Russian borders do not... Uh, have any limits, and certainly any associates of Navalny have always been highly at risk. Yulia as well now. Um, including here? Is that is the thought that that extends to the UK? The, the UK has been a place where we've seen mm. numerous attacks on people like Litvinenko yeah. back in 2006. Yes, I, I mean, for sure. Uh, Diana, great stuff. Thanks so much. So to come here on The Breakfast Show, uh, we speak to two people whose family members are still being held hostage by Hamas.
Play Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Welcome back. Well, in a moment, we'll be speaking to two young Israelis who have family members being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza. That's uh, in just a couple of moments' time. But first, uh, the top stories there. Thank you. Yes, our top stories this morning. A government minister has told this programme that the Conservative Party is happy to spend money donated by businessman Frank Hester on the basis that he's not a racist. The Prime Minister said yesterday that Mr Hester's comments about seeing MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women were racist and wrong. Growth has returned to the UK economy, up 0.2% in January. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the numbers out this morning show the government is making progress in growing the economy. A Sky News investigation has found hundreds of children are using catapults to kill and torture animals before sharing the images on WhatsApp. The government is introducing promised legislation to quash the wrongful convictions of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. The Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollimrake, has told this programme it's great news for innocent branch managers. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. Now, Israeli organisation has brought a delegation to the UK of young adults who have family members being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza. The delegation will hold a press conference at Parliament today and will be joined by a released hostage who was held by Hamas for over 50 days. Well, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined now by Amit Levy and Shay Benjamin, who both have family members being held uh, by Hamas. Um, very good morning to you both. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, uh, Amit, you are the brother of Nama Levy, uh, a 19-year-old uh, hostage, and uh, Shay, you're the daughter of Ron uh, Benjamin, a 53-year-old hostage. Um, if, if you're able to, just, Amit, can you t tell us a little bit about, about your sister? Yeah, of course. Uh, this is my little sister, Nama. Um, you probably saw her video being abducted brutally by the terrorists on the morning of October 7th. Uh, in her pyjamas, with her pants filled with blood. She's the most pure and gentle person I know. Even her name in Hebrew translates to pleasant, Nama, that's what it means. And 
No one deserves being treated that way, especially not the most, the best person I know. Mm -hmm. Nama has always wanted to make the world, the world a better place. In high school, she was a, a big peace activist. She went on delegations with other Palestinians. She majored in diplomacy. She always, I hope she still believes in making the world a better place. I hope she still believes in peace after she's been through 159 days of hell. Mm -hmm. We don't know where she eats, where she sleeps, if she eats, if she sleeps. How she's being treated. We know that she's very badly injured in her leg, uh, like we see in the video mm -hmm. as well. So obviously me and my family are very, very worried. And we came here to ask for the help for everyone who can from everyone who can, uh, and, from the, and from the UK. And, and Shay, it's your father that's a hostage? Yeah, my father, Juan Benjamin, is 53 years old. Uh, on October 7th, he just went to ride his bicycle. Nothing special, just doing the one thing that he really loves, riding his bicycle. And he was kidnapped when he was on his way back to his house on the center of Israel. And he just wanted to get to his family to be with them so they will be safe together but he couldn't make it home. It was an hour drive that turned into 159 days that my dad has not been home. And you can see his eyes. This picture was actually taken 10 minutes before he was kidnapped. You can see how he smiles and not even know that in 10 minutes his life will change forever. And you see, he has two daughters, two daughters me and my sister, and he's our best friend. Mm -hmm. He's the best father in the world. And he always thinks about me and my sister and I'm sure that he's now in the tunnels in Gaza and all he thinks about is us and if we're okay. I, I was going to ask Shay if you've had uh, any updates on his location, his condition. Uh, have you received any, any information like that? Uh, well, my father was uh, missing. He was considered missing for 57 days. So we knew nothing about him. And then the government came and told us that he was kidnapped and he's held hostage in Gaza. Um, and since then, we had no update about him. It was 100 days ago, so we don't know if he's okay now. All we know that he was alive when they told us that. But, you know, even if they will tell me now that he's alive, that can change in any minute because the conditions there are so worse and they're abusing them and raping them. Even the men are being raped over there. And they're not giving them enough food. And I don't think they have this amount of water for even a day. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how they can survive over there. And if they will tell me he's alive now, I don't know if this will be the, the case tomorrow. Amit, um, it's been almost five months now. I, I just wonder how you personally and your family have processed the situation that you're in from, from the start to, to, to today over those five months and the emotions that you've gone through. Um, it's been over five months, actually. And... Mm. and uh... Yeah, we just celebrated the five months a few days ago. It's, it's like an ongoing nightmare, you know, because even when someone dies, you have some time to, to grief. And now we just need to keep fighting. We don't have any other choice. We need to stay strong day after day after day for Nama and for the other hostages and keep fighting for them and keep bringing their voice to the table because they can't. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a fight that we can't stop and we can't eat. I can't walk, I'm not walking, I'm not eating, I can't sleep. I've been in Germany and I came here and I'm always going to delegation and speaking about it everywhere and in the world. And this is our fight, but I don't think it's just our fight. It's not Israel's fight, it's the world's fight because you may see a picture and a name and there may be from Israel, but this is the world's fight because those are human beings and mm -hmm. we can't leave them there. We cannot get this to be the new normal because it happened in Israel. This can happen anywhere else in the world. Can you imagine the terrorists coming inside your house and kidnapping your kids that you don't no. even know where they're sleeping and if they're eating? Mm -hmm. This can be the new normal. Uh, I mean, I just one day there's been so many different types of talks. Um, usually seeking a, a ceasefire on one side and release of hostages uh, on another. And of course, some hostages have been released. When you see news of more of these talks happening and they don't succeed and the talks break down again, what, what's, what's the reaction? 
It's very tough, mm. obviously, like this whole period of time. And, uh, you know, my mom can't stand this. She never watches the news because it's a roller coaster of emotions, hearing one morning that, that the talks are getting better and the next morning that, that the situation is bad. Um, we all hope and pray that there can be a deal. It's a, it's a, it's a weird word when speaking about the life of mm. my sister, but that there could be a good deal that uh, will bring them back and uh, would make the world a bit of a better place, just like Nama wants. And I also, obviously, none of us want the, the uninvolved in Gaza as well being harmed. Uh, but we want them back as well. You know, there, there's never been such such a thing that the Red Cross can't, they don't even let the Red Cross visit them. Ahmet and uh, Shay, thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, good luck in Parliament later, and uh, I'm sure we'll be monitoring your press conference there with uh, uh, the other colleagues, and uh, uh, good luck, and thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. We've got uh, lots more still to come here on Sky News uh, Breakfast. We're going to take a very quick break. Humphrey's 40th anniversary. I can't believe that I co-founded it 40 years ago with my mum, Virginia McKenna, and my dad, Bill Travers. And, and what a great way to, to celebrate with these two young lions, Zar and Jamil. They, as you rightly say, they came from a, a zoo, but actually from a, an ostrich farm. And it was Ukrainian animal activists who first alerted everyone to the situation managed to get the, the animals away from the ostrich farm and via various route through Poland and then uh, into Belgium to a halfway house. And then we've been able, with the help of incredible people, you know, British Airways Holidays, uh, Cargo Lux, DHL, our team at Shamwari in South Africa, it's, it's been an incredible team effort to get them to South Africa where they will live the rest of their lives it's not complete freedom. It can never be complete freedom. These animals have been in captivity uh, too long and it would be too difficult and too dangerous to return them fully to the wild, but they will have a life worth living. The lions do need all sorts of paperwork. In fact, it's one of the biggest challenges that, that anyone who moves uh, animals from one country to another, wild animals from one country to another, especially when it's difficult to get the original paperwork when you have a country like Ukraine, which was face, which is facing so many challenges, you have to have the export paperwork, the health paperwork, the veterinary paperwork to get them out of the country. And then you have to have the reciprocal paperwork in South Africa and hats off to both the Ukrainian and the South African authorities for expediting the paperwork to allow this move to go ahead, because without it, it can't. Well, they will have an enclosure. It'll be about the size of a football field. It's natural uh, South African bush, which uh, at least ancestrally they would have evolved to live in. Uh, they'll be looked after 365 days a year. We have a, an incredible expert team down there led by Glenn and Catherine and Dr. Johan Joubert, who is a, a world-renowned veterinarian, uh, along with the other big cats that we've rescued. And they will have a quality of life. Welcome back. Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan have spoken out against the decision to allow their extradition to the UK from Romania. Bedfordshire police said officers had obtained a European arrest warrant for the two men as part of an ongoing investigation into allegations of rape and human trafficking. Well, Sky's Becky Cottrell is in Bucharest for us this morning. And, and Becky, how much of a surprise did this come uh, to everyone um, yesterday when it crossed? I mean, just the very fact that Bedfordshire police were so far into an investigation. 
Yeah, well, yesterday was the first we'd heard that this investigation is taking place, led by Bedfordshire Police. We don't know a whole lot more about the allegations, other than, as you mentioned, rape and human trafficking. Now, the Tate's lawyers say that these allegations date back to 2012 to 2015. They deny those allegations. Um, but Bedfordshire Police did secure a European arrest warrant, and it was up to a judge in Romania to decide whether Tate uh, and his brother would be extradited. Now, the judge ruled they can be returned to the UK, but only after legal proceedings have wrapped up here in Romania. Here, they've been fighting charges of human trafficking and setting up an organised criminal group. And Andrew Tate is also accused of rape, charges that they deny. Now, it's not clear how long the legal process will take here. A judge is still deciding whether there can be a trial. Um, the brothers have said that all of these allegations are effectively attempts to bring them down. And Andrew Tate has spoken of looking forward to a time when he can receive an apology from the media when their innocence is proven. And they say they think they will probably return to the UK at some point, but they want to stay here and face the legal system here to prove their innocence. They aren't in custody in Romania. They returned home last night after appearing in court, but they aren't allowed to leave the country. Becky, thanks so much. The London Fire Brigade has implemented all 29 recommendations of phase one of the Grenfell Tower inquiry. It says new equipment and changes in policy will save hundreds of lives. But survivors of the tragedy have criticised the government's response, saying it still falls short of protecting vulnerable residents. Rachel Venables has the story. Fresh air, working radios and a clear picture of who was still trapped inside. All problems with the London Fire Brigade's response at Grenfell. These represent significant systemic failings in the organisation of the LFB. I'll just step on. Thanks very much. The first phase of the Grenfell inquiry made 29 recommendations to the brigade, all of which have now been met. Back in 2017, the tallest ladder the London Fire Brigade owned was only half this height, so it could only go up to around the 10th floor of that burning building. This is just one example of the equipment they've changed, the new equipment they've brought in, as well as changing things like their policies and their training. The brigade says if Grenfell happened today, it would get a very different response. We train firefighters and officers now to recognise when a building might not be as safe as it should be, and if necessary, lead an emergency evacuation. And that has saved hundreds of Londoners' lives. But other recommendations to the government have still not been met. This includes a call for all disabled residents in high-rise buildings to have emergency evacuation plans called PEEPs. Adam Gabsey lives on the sixth floor of a building with Grenfell-style cladding, but he's had to fight for a fire survival plan. You can't put a value on my life. How does it make sense that peeps have been recommended by the Grenville Inquiry but are not in place? Anyone can become disabled. You can live in a high rise and become disabled tomorrow. It, it makes moral sense to have evacuation plans in place. Grenfell survivors want the government to be forced to implement all recommendations from public inquiries. My feeling is, is that the government haven't looked at it independently and that they're more worried about cost implications. But, you know, it was cost implications that caused Grenfell in the first place and we can't allow that to happen again. The Home Office says work continues on their remaining recommendations and they're committed to making sure a tragedy like this never happens again. But survivors and campaigners fear without faster change and other tragedy is all too possible. Rachel Venables, Sky News. Phone, wallet, keys, is uh, that your daily reminder uh, before you leave the house? Well, rest assured, our next guest is about to tell us our brains are not designed to remember these little things, but to forget. Uh, and the trick is to learn how to remember better, not more. Well, Dr Charon Ranganath is an eminent neuroscientist in uh, the field, uh, and uh, he's the author of a new book, Why We Remember the Science of Memory and how it shapes us. Uh, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, so, so I'm interested in, in, in reading some of the outline of, of, of the book. Your, your big focus here is that actually we might all lament when we forget certain things, but the brain itself is not actually specifically designed to remember everything. 
That's right. I think um, uh, if you look at the science of memory, what you see over and over and over again is, first of all, most of the details that we experience in a given day are going to be gone, it's an overwhelming majority. And then the second thing is, is the kinds of things we remember are the kinds of things that are biologically important. And by that, I mean the things that give us fear, the things that give the events where we're in states of desire, attachment, love, and so forth. And I think you probably have this experience of, Ooh. if I ask you just to pull up a memory, they're probably going to be the ones that are significant, important. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so take, take that a step further for us. I mean, do, do we as humans therefore approach all of this wrong? We, we kind of shouldn't worry about when we forget things? Or in fact, are there certain tricks in the trade so that we do remember things that aren't so attached to, to the biology and, uh, as you're pointing to? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, we do worry a bit too much. And I think we have some misconceptions. And I think if you shift your perspective from saying, I'm supposed to remember everything to I'm supposed to remember what's important to me. That allows you to change the way that you think about memory in terms of optimizing not to try to get every bit of piece, every piece of information in front of you, but rather asking yourself, am I remembering what matters? And what matters could be what's in work. It could be remembering where you put your keys. It could be uh, taking away memories from uh, the experiences that you have that are important to you with your family and loved ones. And in terms of the tips that, that you can take away, one of the things I would tell you is that uh, there's many different strategies. Most of these strategies, I think, involve having some kind of a cue. So if you think about why we forget, many cases, it's because we have so many competing memories. So think about the keys, for instance. You've put your keys in many, many places over the past week, probably. Or at least if you're like me and you're not very <laughs> organized and you live in, in your head. And so as a result, you have a great deal of competition. And so if you can take a moment to plant a little cue, so for instance, imagine yourself looking for your keys later on, which you will be. Imagine yourself walking, seeing the keys and grabbing them. That's a little cue that you have, so when you walk back to that place, it'll pop into your head. Mm -hmm. So I have two little ones at home, uh, six and three, and they are constantly asking me where blanket is, where a certain toy is. It's really important to them. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder for a moment, for young minds, how can we facilitate and help memory there? Well, so kids are extraordinarily capable of remembering events. Uh, are, uh, let me take that back. Okay. Kids have, are extraordinarily <laughs> capable of learning. As it turns out, during those first few years, they don't actually form memories for events. It's something that actually takes a little while to build up. But one of the things I think that's very important is, is uh, that we can actually do a lot just by interacting with children right. in memory. So one of the things that we know is, is that our memories are a big part of our sense of who we are. And uh, there's actually a great deal of research that suggests that, for instance, mothers who interact with their children about their memories, children can actually incorporate that in their self-concept. And it can have far-reaching effects into getting better grades later on and even resilience to mental illness. So essentially, forgetting a, a memory isn't a bad thing, isn't a sign uh, that we're forgetful or...? Oh, no. Um, well, I'll just pitch the question okay. back to you. So. Think about the last time you got a temporary password. Do you want to remember that? I can think of my hotel room. As soon as I leave here today, I don't want to remember the name of that hotel room or the name, uh, the number of my hotel room. So there's many, many things we have, people you meet in passing, things that you encounter that you don't want to remember. I'm, I'm interested about whether our memories, our ability to remember, is declining with time. Is it a generational uh, decline that is taking place? Maybe it's not taking place at all, but mm. we, we all get uh, helpful, though, me mentioned it in the intro, a cue from your phone or, or the, the ability to rely on technology. Does that mean our brains are getting sort of weaker uh, over time or not? Uh, no, I don't think there's evidence that our brains are getting weaker over time. Um, in fact, there's some reason to think that maybe in comparisons, People might not be doing so bad as, the, as uh, we look at younger generations. Uh, on average, memory tends to go down with age, but some of that is just our ability to find what we need when we need it. I think we've all had those moments when you're trying to remember something and you, and you know it's there, but you can't get it. And that happens increasingly with age. As you're alluding to, there are some issues with modern life which make it worse. So for instance, now that I have a smartphone, I'm always thinking about email. And so even if I'm not checking my email, that thought intrudes into my head and pulls me away from where I should be right now. And so that's these kinds of habits that we have can be detrimental to our everyday memory. 
But essentially, the human brain is amazing. The capacity for memory is fascinating. My brother's a, a London black taxi driver, and using a certain part of his brain to memorise London is quite phenomenal, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, there's a great deal of work on London taxi drivers uh, that's been done by Eleanor McGuire and Hugo Spears here in London. And it's just extraordinary, their capability to mm. be able to map out these spaces. And having driven around London quite a bit, <laughs> I have nothing but admiration for your brother. What, one thing, story I saw picked up in the book, which I'm interested in, is how our memory can sort of exaggerate or embellish a past memory. The more we kind of recount it, that it, the memory actually changes and, and morphs. Talk, talk to me a bit about that and whether you can stop that in its tracks such that it doesn't sort of get, get out of... I, I always remember myself as being quite good at football and then I, I play again, I realise uh, my memory's <laughs> playing tricks on me here again. But, but how do you stop that happening? Well, so uh, the first principle is to understand that it happens. So we tend to think that we replay the past, but in fact what happens is we remember some bits and bobs from the past and then we imagine how things could have been, right? And so we have these little biases. We tend to be optimistic and we tend to see ourselves better than mm. we might have really been. Uh, so that's part of it. But then every time we recall a memory, we re-encode it. And so these memories can change over time. And so the key bit is to, first of all, be a bit skeptical and then to ask yourself, OK, what are the things that might be inconsistent with my mm -hmm. interpretation? Dr. Sharon Ranganath, really fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. Um, we've got only about 30 seconds left, but we are still going to get to these photographs because we, we, we mentioned them earlier. We saw them last time. It's worth seeing them again. The Sony World Photography Competition winners have been revealed. Uh, and here are some uh, of the winners as uh, we leave you uh, at the end of uh, this hour. Uh, we can have a look at some of the pictures. Um, mm. Fantastic uh, uh, as they were. This one was taken by Liam Mann, who won landscape category. Uh, we've also uh, got a, a photograph taken by Michelle Sank, who won the Portraiture Award. Uh, some fantastic photos. More of them, by the way, mm. on the Sky News website. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break here. We'll be back with all of the day's headlines.
A very good morning to you. It is nine o'clock on today's show. Rishi Sunak condemns comments by his party's biggest donor as racist, but a minister tells this programme they're still happy to take his money. But what is it really like to be an MP? You've spent the day with a politician who says she's constantly having to think about her safety. Plus, we'll tell you about an inspiring story of brotherly love. It is Wednesday, the 13th of March. Here are your headlines. A Conservative minister tells Sky News the party's happy to spend millions of pounds given by a major donor accused of racist comments. Is the party content to spend his money? Well, it, it, on the basis he's not a racist and has apologised for what he said, yes. With MP safety in the spotlight, we have the story of Zara Sultana, the youngest Muslim MP ever elected in the UK and now the most threatened. Someone who said, you need to be deported, you send that to Palestine, they are low on targets. A Sky News investigation finds hundreds of children using catapults to kill and torture animals before sharing sick images on WhatsApp. The government say legislation to quash the convictions of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal was good news for thousands of people. And pictures of perfection captured on camera will bring you the images that won the Sony World Photography Competition. A very good morning to you. A Conservative minister has told this programme his party is happy to spend money from a major party donor who made comments described by Rishi Sunak as racist and wrong. Frank Hester, the man who gave £10 million to the Conservatives last year, apologised for saying MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. Well, the Metropolitan Police have confirmed that they have been contacted about the incident, which comes uh, while there are rising concerns over extremist language and threats to MPs. We'll talk about that uh, with Mari in a moment. Uh, but first, here are the comments made by the Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollenrick, to us on this programme two hours ago. I'm not excusing it at all. Uh, these comments were wrong. Racist is apologised. That's not, that's not excusing his comments. No, no, I agree. But I'm asking the question, is the party content to spend his money? Well, it, it, on the basis he's not a racist and has apologised for what he said, yes. Well, in response, Labour called for the money to be handed back and uh, criticise Rishi Sunak's handling um, uh, of this, which we'll come to in, in just a moment. Ma Mari, uh, the, the question yesterday was the extent to which the party was going to condemn them and what language th they used. Uh, the focus today was always going to be whether they'd hand the money back or not, and yeah. quite a perhaps surprising, but definitive answer from Kevin Hollerick. Yeah, absolutely. So Kevin Hollerick saying, yes, we're going to keep the money, we're happy to keep the money, it's no problem. Also, Kevin Hollerick has said to other journalists this morning that if uh, Frank Hester were to give more money, uh, the Conservative Party would be happy to receive it. So uh, a very uh, much a clear message uh, compared to yesterday from the government about where they stand on this. The difficulty is how much pressure Conservative MPs, Conservative activists will put on the party, on the Prime Minister, to think again. Let me give you some examples. So Andy Street, the West Midlands mayor, uh, a very famous Tory figure, he has been speaking to journalists this morning and he said if he had received that donation, he would have returned it. And he said, I would think about the company I kept and I would give that money back. So we've got some pressure mounting now. We've got a Tory MP, Nuzgani, uh, who has tweeted this morning saying, zero tolerance on racism is just a slogan in today's politics. Uh, so uh, a Tory MP there, clearly very angry and frustrated about the way this has been handled by uh, the party and by the Prime Minister. Also, sources have been speaking to our very own Beth Rigby here at Sky News and have told her that there is some uh, anger that people are said to be fuming that Kemi Badenoch broke ranks yesterday and called out the comments as racist when that was not the government line, that was not the party line, which then essentially made the Prime Minister row in behind Kemi Badenoch and therefore looking like he was following her lead, despite the fact that he is supposedly the leader. Mm -hmm. So this is all starting to show that there are a few cracks here in the Conservative Party and evidently not everybody in the party, whether that be the West Midlands Mayor or the Tory MPs, are happy with the way this is being handled and the way the government is trying to close this down now. The question 
question is, what will the Prime Minister be asked at PMQs about this? And will his responses be adequate enough to kind of calm down the anger amongst the Tory ranks? Well, we can uh, get an insight as to the angles Keir Starmer might take uh, while facing uh, Rishi Sunak from what Jonathan Ashworth of Labour told us earlier. We've done a lot in the Labour Party to change the Labour Party under Keir Starmer's leadership to deal with the problems that we had with anti-Semitism. That took leadership, that took a strong approach from Keir Starmer, but Rishi Sunak's not doing the same, is he? He dilly-dallied around Lee Anderson and his Islamophobic remarks. He dilly-dallied on this thing. And I think in the end it's because he's so weak. Look, you only need to go over there. You can talk to Tory MPs mm -hmm. who are questioning whether Rishi Sunak can continue in power uh, or not, whether his time is up. We know he's overseeing an absolutely chaotic party and he's struggling to get a grip and he's not in control of events. But he should, when he's confronted with racism, do the decent thing and hand this money back. So you see the Labour Party continuing to say that they think that, that money should be handed back. I think the difficulty for the Prime Minister, and this is what we were saying earlier, isn't it, Wilfred, that these scandals, 50% of the problem is how they're handled. And I think the difficulty with this is actually, it's a question and a, a conversation that's now being had around Rishi Sunak's ability to lead, his leadership and his ability to actually keep a level of discipline within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. And the more you see these kind of ministers, whether it be Andrew Barry after the, the budget, for instance, whether it be Kemi Bade not yesterday in this uh, racist abuse, how, how does this reflect on the Prime Minister when he's unable to keep his ministers, his cabinet ministers, in check and they continue to start to undermine him? That is a really key question. Mark, great stuff as always. Thanks so much. And we'll be discussing more of this, of course, in our political discussion. Katie Balls and Ian Dunt at half past the hour. Um, we should also put some context uh, about it uh, because uh, it comes... Uh, as, of course, MPs set safeties in the spotlight. And uh, on that note, our political correspondent, Serena Barker Singh, spent the day uh, with the Coventry MP, Zara Sartana, who described the threats she'd been facing. Zara Sartana. Recording the time and the location on a constituency visit, this is one of the many security precautions this Labour MP has to take before every single event. This year, she's found out that she's received the most threats and serious abuse of any MP online, 68% more than the next most targeted MP. She says a notable uptick since speaking up about the rights of the Palestinian people. What do you get online? I'll, I'll start off with someone who said, you need to be deported, you <laughs> send that <laughs> to Palestine, they are low on targets. Just going to speak MPs' duties have become more risky for members under threat. In the back of minds are the two MPs killed in their constituencies. House conventions have also been upended by safety concerns. Parliamentary authorities know safety is fundamental to democracy and offer a number of security measures for members. Door knocking can be one of the most exposing moments for an MP. It's child loss. For Zara, she says the majority of her abuse, 54%, has been categorised as Islamophobic. I think the Prime Minister has used his platform to whip up fear, hate and Islamophobia. And that is incredibly dangerous. The Prime Minister disputes this, saying he has called out Islamists and the far right, but expressed concern about protests like this one. Zara says it's vital she attends these demonstrations to represent her constituents and community. The more you're in the public sphere, it feels like the more you're being attacked. It weighs heavily. Um, it's difficult, but I remind myself why, why I got involved in politics in the first place. and. I'm reminded about all of these values that I have that I share with millions of other people across the country. Zara says she will now increase her security measures. For some MPs, though, the risks are still too high and said they have had no choice but to step down before the next general election. Serena Buxing, Sky News. Now, growth has returned to the UK economy as new figures out this morning suggested a 0.2% boost in January. Our business presenter, Ian King, is uh, in the city and joins me now. Um, Ian, put into context for us a little bit what, what this number um, means. And I guess, of course, we don't know what's to come. But if it is the end of the recession, uh, what, what is the context of the recession that we just had? 
Uh, that's right, Wilf. Uh, in the uh, final half of uh, last year, the UK entered a, a technical recession defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. A very shallow one, it has to be said. In the third quarter of last year, the economy contracted by 0.1% and in the final three months of the year uh, by 0.3%. Uh, that's very, very easily revised. Uh, the figures are prone to revision and uh, it would no, be no surprise to see those uh, that recession revised out of the history books in due course. But I think what today's number can tell us pretty definitively is that if we were in recession, we're already out of it. Uh, a 0.2 per cent uh, rise in GDP during the month was uh, driven largely by the services sector, which of course accounts for four-fifths of GDP. And um, with most economists expecting uh, the economy to have grown in February as well, it looks pretty likely that uh, we will see a positive outturn for the first three months of this year. So in other words, we would be out of uh, what has been one of the most shallow and shortest uh, recessions in uh, UK economic history. Now, in terms of of uh, what was behind the January number. Well, as I say, it was largely driven by the services sector, retail and wholesale activity, pretty uh, robust during the month. Uh, production output uh, saw contraction, but even there, manufacturing uh, output actually rose. Um, and the real surprise, I think, was construction, where you saw 1.1% uh, growth during the month. That compared with 0.9% contraction during December. The uh, house building uh, sector, uh, pretty robust there. Now, the numbers, Wilf, were in line with expectations. Expectations. There's been very, very little market reaction. The pound, in fact, right now is more or less exactly unchanged against uh, the US dollar. Little uh, response on the gilt market as well. But I think the, uh, the Chancellor will probably take some comfort from these figures. It's nothing to write home about in uh, reality. I mean, uh, the UK is still uh, growing very, very slowly. But uh, compared with uh, the picture elsewhere, for example, in Germany, well, it's reasonably encouraging. All right, great stuff, Ian, and we look forward to further analysis uh, on Business Live at 11.30. Uh, Leah, though, time for the other top stories now. Thank you very much, Wilfred. It's almost official. Joe Biden and Donald Trump will face each other in November's US election. Uh, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump have secured enough delegates to win their party's presidential nominations. That's after primaries in Georgia, Mississippi and Washington and Hawaii's Republican caucuses. Ukraine has launched a series of drone attacks on Russia uh, for the second night in a row, again targeting energy facilities. 58 drones were shot down overnight, according to the Russian Defence Ministry. The overnight attacks on Tuesday hit oil sites deep inside Russia, including Nizhny Novgorod region. Meanwhile, Russia claims to have killed 234 fighters, uh, stopping an incursion from across its border with Ukraine. Soldiers who Ukraine say and Russian volunteers fighting for Kyiv claim to have entered in Russia's Kursk and Belgorod regions. In a statement, the Russian Defence Ministry blamed the attack on the Kyiv regime, also saying they destroyed seven tanks and five armoured vehicles. <clears throat> The government is introducing its promised legislation to quash wrongful convictions for hundreds of sub-postmasters caught up in the post office scandal. Now, the new law will exonerate most of those convicted in England and Wales in what has been branded the biggest miscarriage of justice in British legal history. And those postmasters who are effective will receive an interim compensation payment with the option of immediately taking a fixed and final offer of £600,000. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Do you have... This is still meant to be your story. I've picked it up too you soon. You're taking up my um, auto-cue there, I, mister. I do get very confused. <laughs> I do get very confused. It's not my show. Although I, that excuse I was maybe allowed to make when it was my first time. Three days in a row, I can't. <laughs> so my apologies. No problem. Back to you. A couple of questions for you this morning. Do you have a long beard? <sighs> Facial piercings or tattoos or a brightly coloured mohawk? If so... Well, you're in high demand. That's because research by the charity Guide Dogs has revealed almost two-thirds of dogs have reacted with fear or confusion or attributes they have not been exposed to before. And now puppies are experiencing all types of human styles to set them up for their future jobs, Wilfred. So I have an excuse. I, it's not really a legitimate one, so I shouldn't air it. I knew my next story was animals, and I saw it ah. said animals. So I picked it up. Uh, but it's a very different animal story. Absolutely. So, uh, we, should, we should change the tone on it. But, Leah, thank you. My Welcome. apologies. Um, right, uh, Sky News uh, can reveal that uh, children are filming themselves using catapults to kill and torture animals uh, in a UK-wide network on WhatsApp. Well, our correspondent, uh, Amelia 
Harper joins us uh, for more uh, on this quite extraordinary story. It is. The footage is really awful. This is a UK-wide network of children who are filming themselves and photographing themselves killing, shooting and, in some cases, abusing animals as well. As part of this report, I've had to view over 350 pieces of material posted across 11 catapult groups, as they're called, on the app, and a warning that this report does contain distressing imagery. Darkness has fallen. This, the setting for an execution. A bird singled out, about to be shot by children. The impact of the fall minor compared to the incoming kick. And this is the weapon of choice, a catapult. The victim this time, a squirrel. Sky News has uncovered a UK-wide network of animal shooting and torture carried out by children using catapults. Filming and photographing their kills, this material is shared on WhatsApp against their terms of use. An investigation has uncovered 11 catapult groups on the app with nearly 500 members like this one. We're seeing more and more injured animals being reported to us that have been hit by a catapult. You can go and buy a catapult very easily and use it to target animals, which is illegal and offences will be committed. And injured animals end up here. The Swan Sanctuary, which rescues waterfowl, has 20 birds, all with catapult injuries, in their hospital pens. Most of the injuries are head injuries, neck injuries, pure kill shots. They're there to try and kill these animals. Fractures to the facial areas, eyes exploding, uh, windpipes bursting. <sighs> yeah, it's... I'm sorry, I've gone. Causing unnecessary suffering to an animal is illegal. But when it comes to catapults, there's a gap in the law. People can buy them, carry them, and here they're being used to kill. The Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 is the relevant legislation protecting wildlife in England and Wales, but catapults aren't covered anywhere under those laws. Henry Smith is part of a group of MPs working to lift animal welfare standards. Government uh, and Parliament should look to legislate in terms of the sale of catapults and also for those who use catapults as a weapon to inflict injury and suffering, uh, that there is a criminal sanction to that. Big Canadian goose, dead as a dodo. Documented on WhatsApp, this rabbit just another victim of an emerging trend where catapults are used by children to kill. Calls have been made to tighten the laws. The question is, will it stop them? So you can see the impact that it's having there on volunteers who are involved in rescuing these animals. Danny Rogers there, visibly emotional, and he's texted me as, as a result of our report this morning. He has had calls about this uh, into his swan sanctuary. Um, this is being termed an emerging trend by the RSPCA. They are saying to me that they've already had conversations and are starting to have conversations with more and more police forces who are seeing animals being killed with these weapons in this way. And some of the, the tone in these WhatsApp groups is apparent because some of the voice notes in them are really celebratory of the kills. One example, I killed 16 things today, lads. Another one is go straight through the rabbit's head. And these are killings for fun. There is no legal reason why these should be happening. So I think there are calls to tighten up the legislation because catapults are not classed as an illegal weapon. Amelia, great stuff. Thanks so much. We're going to have a quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The rest of the week will stay unsettled with localised flooding, but southwesterly winds mean it'll be very mild. Rain will continue to clear northern parts of the UK this morning while lingering across northern England, north Wales and much of Ireland. To the south, it'll be mainly dry, but there'll be plenty of cloud around, uh, which will bring some light rain to the hills. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So to come here on The Breakfast Show, Brotherly Love, the text message which resulted in one man removing his sibling from the care system. We'll speak to the brothers about their powerful story. And what it takes to capture an award-winning photo, we hear from the winners of the Sony World Photography Awards.
today's Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Brother, do you love me? Uh, those were the words which Reuben, who has Down syndrome uh, and was at the time living in a care home, texted to his brother Manny. It was that text message which sparked Manny's decision to immediately remove his brother from the care system. The brothers have published a book together about the depths of their brotherhood and uh, Reuben and Manny Co. Uh, join uh, us now and uh, it's great to see you both. And uh, Ruben, the, the, we just mentioned the book, and I know the book is out um, out now. The, what what the, the title of the book stems from the, the text message. What, what, what's the title of the book? Um, Brother, do you love me? Brother, do you love me? It's, it's such a, a, a wonderful question, and it, it stems, Manny, from the text message. Yeah, uh, Ruben was trapped in care during the pandemic and uh, was in a really, really dark place. I live in Spain, so I was trapped, couldn't get to him. And when he was at his worst, he sent me this text message, brother, do you love me? And, and Ruben, do you, do you still remember that, that moment when you, you sent the text to your brother? Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, Manny, it's led to so much since then. Yeah, well, we call it the bro nap, don't we, Rubes? <laughs> I bro napped him from care and uh, got into a little bit of trouble with social services. Took him out for the weekend and never took him back. And Ruben and I spent 26 weeks in a, in a little cottage in Dorset together. And that's the book. The book is the 26 weeks we spent together. I and mean, you say it really quickly now, but 26 weeks is half a year. And we were in isolation in a cottage in Dorset. And that's the story of the book is how we repaired ourselves. Ruben was a very, very broken man. He was non-verbal for almost a year. So the book is about how we put him back together again. And you can tell the bond between the both of you mm -hmm. is so strong. We get on, don't we, Ruben? <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ruben, what do you love about your brother? What's the best thing about this guy? Uh, he's my brother. Mm. Yeah. And I love him. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm so proud of him. He's come so far. 
Um, he was a broken man, and here he is talking to you guys. This would have been inconceivable. Absolutely. Look at ago. us in this studio with lights, with lots of different people around. It's so important that this is represented, and Down Syndrome Day is on the 21st of March. How important is that? What do you think people need to get away from that day? What, what do you call it, Ribs? Yes! Ribs, is, Ribs wants to name it, <laughs> rename it Up Syndrome. <laughs> um, because he doesn't want to be down about having Down syndrome, so we've renamed it Up Syndrome. I love it. Um, and we'll be part of the World Up Syndrome celebrations on the 21st of March. Well, that, I mean, that's a, a fantastic idea, uh, Ruben, and a brilliant <laughs> one to, to come up with. M Manny, I just... I, I, my question is sort of two-part. The, the difficulty um, of coming to terms and embracing Down syndrome itself, and, and then the second part of... The, the care system and the problems uh, that you uh, or Ruben ex experienced there. Can you talk us through your, your experiences of that? Absolutely. Ruben's in the, the care home that I broke him out of, um, he was isolated, kept isolated in his room during the pandemic for 23 hours a, a day. Mm. Um, Ruben's is now back in care in an assisted living place um, with, with 23 hours of one-to-one -one care a week. Um, that's a, a great team who are helping him now be independent. They're helping him to regain all of his skill set that he'd lost. Um, there are some brilliant people within the care system that we've had heroes who've helped us all the way through our story. Um, we think that they're incredibly undervalued. Um, mm. And, you know, the care that, that Ruben has now is exemplary. And it is out there. It sometimes takes a while to get to that point. But now people are looking after Ruth that really care about him and his future. Mm -hmm. And the book, finally. Who is it for? Who do you think should go out and buy it? Well, someone once said, anybody who's ever cared for somebody mm. should read the book. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need someone with up syndrome in your life. We're hearing from people who, who it's an access for them to, to understand what it is to have Down syndrome for someone like Rubes. Anybody should read the book, really. It's a story we can all relate to. Mm -hmm. um, Ruben started drawing when he was nonverbal, and his drawings are in the book. So oh, I, I write it, and Ruben illustrates it. And, Manny, I can understand why you want to share this story, because you must be immensely proud of your brother. So proud. Yeah, so proud. There were, there were days when, when I thought I'd lost him. We had a psychiatric assessment, and the psychiatrist gave me a 10% chance of getting him back. Mm. because he'd had a psychological re regression. So we had to fight hard to get Rubes back, but you're back, aren't you, babes? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Ruben, th for the last word, I just wanted to, to come to you. I mean, it's incredibly inspiring, the story you've shared, the way you've, you've handled up syndrome so, so well. But you, you must also be very thankful and, and grateful for your brother. Mm. Well... It's it's resoundingly yes. clear, and watching uh, and seeing seeing this bond, it's 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 really very moving, and, and we thank you for for coming thanks on today. For having us, Ruben and Manny, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, we're going to take a quick break here on uh, Sky News Breakfast, and when we come back, we'll be discussing all of the day's uh, political news uh, as the row over a donation from a top Conservative Party backer accused of racist comments dominates attention here in Westminster. We'll be right back.
Oh, welcome back to The Breakfast Show. In a moment, we'll be talking uh, politics uh, with Katie and Ian, as usual, on a Wednesday morning ahead of uh, PMQs. But first, uh, time for the top stories, Leah. Thank you very much. Well, our top stories then. A government minister has told this programme that the Conservative Party is happy to spend money donated by businessman Frank Hester on the basis that he's not a racist. The Prime Minister said yesterday that Mr Hester's comments that seeing the MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women were racist and wrong. Growth has returned to the UK economy, up 0.2% in January. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the numbers show the government is making progress in growing the economy. A Sky News investigation has found hundreds of children are using catapults to kill and torture animals before sharing the images on WhatsApp. The government is introducing promised legislation to quash the wrongful convictions of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. The Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollimrake, has told this programme it's great news for innocent branch managers. Yeah, great stuff, thank you. Right, let's get to today's uh, political uh, stories and discussion. Joining me now, the political editor at The Spectator, Katie Balls, and the columnist at The Eye, Ian Dunt. A very good morning to you both. Great to see you both. So let's start with this uh, debate over the Tory donor, Mr Hester, and his comments. I think most interesting to me, Katie, is how things unfolded yesterday that concluded with the Prime Minister calling his comments racist and wrong. But an awful lot came before that. Do, do you think he was bounced into this by Kemi Badenoch or do you think it was a sort of normal evolution of, of how these things work in, in politics? I think it's hard to see the Kemi Badenoch tweet and her intervention calling the comments racist and not think that's something to do with uh, number 10 blatantly putting out the statement suggesting that the Prime Minister shared that analysis because as you saw in this show and throughout the day at the lobby briefings, that was not the line. Now, I think there's always a case of getting to somewhere. It's always... Um, I think, you know, people go and say it takes a very long time to make a decision, but I think on some things, which is, is a comment racist or not, is a comment offensive, you can probably make quite a quick gut decision. What is clearly quite complicated for the Tories about this is as soon as you do say the comments are racist, which is now the line of the Prime Minister, the Cabinet and MPs, um, that begs the question, well, are you going to return the money he's given you? And uh, if, if you're not going to return it, are you going to keep spending money in future from him? And that's clearly uh, not something they want to say no to, um, which I think probably explains some of the delays so far. Um, in, I mean, part of the problem yesterday was this uh, failure to draw a line under it quickly. Are they going to fail to draw a line under the question of should they give the money back or not? Yeah. I mean, look, we're clearly looking at one of the most staggeringly inept political operations we've seen for years. I mean, all of yesterday is an object lesson in how not to do it. You do not just try and adopt a line that anyone in their right mind can see is false. You can't look at a statement that repeatedly talks about gender and race and say, well, this statement's got nothing to do with gender and race. It doesn't matter who you are or what your political perspective is. Of course it was. Now they've adopted this line of like, well, even if he is a racist, oh, beg your pardon, sorry. He's not a racist, he just says racist things and therefore we get to keep the money. All of that relies on the man's apology. The man's apology was not for racism. The man's apology is a very contorted mess of very sorry about the hurt cause, but also I'm not a racist and I didn't, you know, alludes to the idea that he didn't say anything like that without explicitly denying it. And that is not a tenable position to be in. Mm -hmm. So if they are relying on that apology for their current posture, they're going to find themselves in all of the same problems that they've had over the last 24 hours. Katie, are they in a position where they can return this money? Well, I think what's complicated, of course, is A, has it already been spent? It's also an election year. I don't think um, Labour or the Tories will want to return much money going into this. And I think if you look um, at, I suppose, the, the fact that this uh, man has now become their biggest donor, has been giving an interview, it feels like a, a story that's almost um, been timed for maximum embarrassment. And I think the fact he now has that association uh, with, ultimately, uh, Rishi Sunak makes it, makes it tricky in saying they speak quite a lot and so forth. Katie, what did you make of Kemi Badenoch breaking rank there yesterday afternoon, uh, the only black woman in Cabinet, to, to really call it out for what it was? Yes, I think it was clearly more impactful coming from her, and I think the fact that lots of her... Uh, 
white colleagues had been saying, oh, and your cabinet colleagues saying, oh, it's not there. I, as soon as you had Kemi Baden not saying that, I don't think they could repeat that line. Mm. Um, I also think it's quite like Kemi Baden not to be quite uh, one to speak her mind. And that's why, uh, you know, number 10 and her team won't say, oh, this is um, something. They won't say whether she acted of her own accord or, or cleared it with them first. But she's definitely, I think, someone who would not be silenced or cajoled into saying something just because she was being told that was the line to take. Mm. Um, in, in terms of moving this on, a, a little bit clearly uh, one of the Labour attack lines on this is it shows how weak Rishi Sunak is that he didn't sort of come down harder uh, initially do you think that's a, a fair summation or, or just more broadly when we consider uh, as well the Lee Anderson defection and we consider this 1922 conversation or meeting earlier in the week um, is the pressure on him internally within the party at fever pitch or is it just ticking up a little bit very much the latter, but not at FIFA pitch, because the Conservatives know that it's preposterously absurd for them to change leader again before a general election. And they also know that under this leader, they're going to lose in the general election. And these two doom-laden scenarios have basically reduced them to a state of inactivity. So it bubbles away and it bubbles away. It's not just the weakness, though. It's really the judgment. And it's two weeks since he made a speech on extremism outside of Downing Street. Yeah. With, with, to, to come up with something that's sort of this inept in terms of judgment, you really have to go back to John Major and back to basics. You know, you set yourself up with exactly the punishment that will be handed to you by establishing a moral line to which you cannot keep. That is a situation that Sunak has created for himself and it is one that he will continue to deliver over the next few weeks. And then, Katie, the tone then of PMQs, where do you think uh, Rishi Sunak will position himself this afternoon? Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be incredibly surprising if Keir Starmer didn't go on the row about uh, the donations. Um, and therefore, you could see almost this preemptive move last night for Rishi Sunak to get ahead of it. Partly, I think, Kemi Baden not statement, but also knowing this is going to come up. So say something now. And therefore, I imagine he'd be quite critical. I do think, to Ian's point, uh, it is a pretty bad mood in the Tory party right now. I don't think we're at the point where there is a serious threat to Rishi Sunak, but the number of people saying, you know, look at the polls, look how bad things are going, you know, what is the plan? Obviously, Tories have to say Labour doesn't have a plan, but you have Tory MPs asking what their plan is, um, does mean that he does need to, I think, offer his MPs something. Um, in what do you make of Keir Starmer's performance at PMQs in the last couple of weeks? Because th there's been quite a lot of ammunition to land some heavy blows. Mm. Has he always successfully done that in recent weeks? No. Six out of ten on PMQ performances for Keir Starmer. Um, far more impressive, actually, is when he talks on a more personal basis, as he has done in a couple of TV interviews, mm. including sort of morning TV yesterday. Great one with Sophia earlier in the week. Absolutely, yeah. And there you see a, a sort of much more compelling vision of him, I think, and one that's actually sort of a much more electorally powerful. He's quite effective when it comes to forensic questioning in the Commons because of his background, because of that loyally sort of experience. He's good at holding to account in that way. But I'd say ultimately his most effective TV performances are much more personal and, and human, as they have been over the course of this week. Final question to you both latest uh, chances of them calling the May election in the next 10 days? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think this week makes it even more unlikely. Um, you are always going to hope in politics that something is going to turn up, even uh, if it's a very small chance of it. Do you agree? It's not going to happen. It's there we go. May. Definitive. Uh, guys, as always, great to see you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Now, in the last year, there's been a 13-fold rise in the number of anti-migrant protests, according to exclusive statistics from Hope Not Hate. Anti-migrant protesters in Scampton say their message has been muddied by far-right protesters who've joined them at the location. Sky's Data and Forensics correspondent Tom Cheshire has this report. This is a very local protest. The traffic thunders by RAF Scampton. People here have been campaigning for a year to stop the Home Office, turning it into accommodation for 2,000 asylum seekers. A year in now. Pretty permanent setup, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> the locals, like Sarah, had to contend with another group turning up to hijack their cause. Outsiders, far right nationalists. The main group were sort of pretty far right, and then there, there were people there that maybe weren't quite as aware of situation that we're supporting them. Fights broke out and the police were called out regularly. Sarah says she and her husband were assaulted by men wearing balaclavas. Our analysis of new figures from advocacy group Hope Not Hate, shared exclusively with Sky News, shows how protests like these are becoming a new battleground for the far right.
there's been this big surge in anti-migrant protests like this one over the last year, but that contains multitudes. It can be legitimate political protests. There's also fears that it can be hijacked by right-wing groups. The demonstration in RAF Scampton is just one of many across the UK. There are 275 anti-migrant events in 2023. 159 of those were visits, where people try and gain access to hotels where migrants are being held. 116 were demonstrations, a 13-fold increase on the year before. And that may reflect a rise in confidence on the hard right, perhaps because many of the themes they champion are becoming mainstream. If this idea of invasion sounds familiar, well, you may have heard it somewhere else before. The British people deserve to know which party is serious about stopping the invasion on our southern coast. The language of the far right swilling around the web now making its way to Westminster, according to political scientists. I don't think politicians anymore are, if you like, insulated from um, the language and some of the behaviour of, of the far right. I think they pick it up uh, on social media and they're willing to use some of the words that uh, those groups uh, you know, uh, tend to bandy about um, you know, quite easily. The question is what all that means in an election year, with the Conservative Party facing pressure from further right. National questions. But RAF Scampton is a reminder that all politics, even on the far right, is local. Yeah. Tom Cheshire, Sky News, Lincolnshire. Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan have spoken out against the decision to allow their extradition to the UK from Romania. Bedfordshire police said officers, has, uh, officers had obtained a European arrest warrant for the two men as part of an ongoing investigation into allegations of rape and human trafficking. This guy's Becky Goshrells in uh, Bucharest for us this morning. And uh, uh, Becky, unsurprisingly, they've speak, spoken out uh, against this, but uh, remind us how it all unfolded yesterday. Well, we found out that were these allegations being investigated by Bedfordshire Police. The Tate's lawyers say those allegations relate to the period between 2012 and 2015. These are allegations that they deny. Then yesterday we heard that in relation to that European arrest warrant, the brothers can be returned to the UK, but only after judicial proceedings have wrapped up here in Romania. Here they are facing allegations of human trafficking and setting up an organised criminal gang. Andrew Tate is also accused of rape. Again, allegations that they deny. Now, it's not clear how long legal proceedings may take here. A judge is still deciding whether a trial can take place. But the brothers aren't in custody. Uh, they returned home yesterday after those court proceedings and came out to the media and said that they are, you know, looking forward to proving their innocence and ultimately, they hope, getting a, an apology from the media for reporting these allegations. Seems that they're feeling less chatty today. Andrew Tate did appear. He zoomed past us in one of his cars, rolled down the window uh, and filmed us, but unfortunately didn't want to speak. Becky, uh, thanks uh, so much for that. Becky Cottrell there in Bucharest. We'll sort of come in on The Breakfast Show, where we'll be speaking about President Putin, who's uh, been giving a speech today and says Russia is ready to use nuclear weapons uh, and gives his opinion on Joe Biden. Diana Magnick will join us here on set next. Sky News. From the Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better.
I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. If you forgot your pyjamas, Emirates has got you covered. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Uh, Vladimir Putin has said that Russia is ready to use nuclear weapons if there is a threat to his country's sovereignty or independence. In an interview with Russian state television, the Russian leader described the US President Joe Biden as a veteran politician who fully understands the dangers of an escalation in tensions. The United States announced that they were not going to send troops. We know what American troops are on the Russian territory. These are invaders. This is how we will treat it, even if they appear on the territory of Ukraine and they understand this. I said that Biden is a representative of the traditional political school and this is proved. But besides Biden, there are plenty of other specialists in the field of Russian-American relations and in the field of strategic deterrence. Therefore, I don't think that everything is rushing so head-on here, but we are ready for this. Our international correspondent, Diana Magne, is here uh, with us now. So, Diana, talk us through the context of the way he mentioned the nuclear word again and, and if that's new or a reiteration of existing policy or perspective. So, I, I think, we, you know, it, it is in line with Russia's strategic nuclear doctrine, which is that they will only use their nuclear weapons if, they, uh, if the existence of the Russian state comes under attack. But I think the fact that he brings up... Uh, Russia's nuclear arsenal really at every opportunity is quite significant and here we heard him saying you know we don't think that the US will deploy troops to Ukraine but if they did we would consider them an invading force. Um, so you know this was a very long interview an hour and a half ahead of elections which start on Friday go on until Sunday um, and uh, he always acts as though you know it's not us who would ever use nuclear weapons but if we come under attack but the fact of the matter is nobody else is mentioning mm -hmm. nuclear stuff it's always Putin and it's always a threat. Uh, the other thing to talk about, uh, Diana, while you're here, is that that major uh, drone attack on, on Russia. What do we know about that? What are the details? So, the last couple of days, we've seen quite a significant uptick in attacks from Ukraine onto Russian soil. So, overnight, the Russian Ministry of Defence said there were 58 uh, drones intercepted. Um, the, Rush the Ukrainian SBU security services have said they targeted three oil refineries to try and cut uh, Russia's economic activity. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing more of this ahead of the election. But yesterday, what was significant was it was a major armed incursion. We've seen this kind of thing before. But in that interview, Putin said 230 attackers were killed. We cannot verify that, obviously. But these are always Russian groups acting from Ukraine on behalf of Ukraine against Russia for the liberation of Russia. So wrap your head around that. Mm. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, the other thing that we were talking a little bit earlier is this uh, ally of Alexei Navalny. 
uh, Navalny, excuse me, um, was attacked in Lithuania? Yes, Leonid Volkov. He used to be the head of the um, Anti-Corruption Foundation. He's still a very significant sort of player amongst Navalny's aides. And I think it was only a matter of time that we would see an attack on one of those Navalny associates. And um, he was attacked with a hammer, tear gas. Uh, they broke his arm. A, a group calling themselves Male State, who are a sort of far-right patriotic extremist group in Russia, have claimed responsibility. Um, but I think it goes to show that you are not safe uh, if you are an enemy of Russia, wherever you are, whether that's Lithuania, whether it's further afield, that the long arm of the Russian law will come after you. I wanted to talk about uh, President Putin's sort of current status at home. Uh, the elections coming up this weekend are, I guess, a, a peg to ask the question, not that we think uh, the outcome is in doubt at all. But um, how has the last couple of months gone for him? I mean, domestically, has he strengthened his grip more than, you know, many months ago? I think the surprising thing is that this war has solidified his support. Um, and he has crushed all opposition, I mean, as we've seen from, from Navalny. And the fact that he, for this election, really doesn't want to see any kind of opposition. You know, Boris Nedezhdin, who was running on an anti-war campaign, has not been allowed to run. He was sort of a systemic uh, figure anyway. Um, and, uh, and I think the other thing to mention ahead of these elections is that Putin is feeling clearly quite confident. He says in that interview, you know, no, no doubt that we are winning in, in Ukraine at the moment. Um, so it's surprising that on the one hand, he seems buoyed by confidences, uh, sort of confidence vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. And on the other, he's still too scared to have any degree of opposition to him in country. Um, but I think we will see quite significant uh, turnout, quite significant support um, in these elections this weekend. So, so genuine turnout and support for him? Yeah, I mean, there'll, there'll be a lot of state employees bust in, as we always see. But yeah. yes, people feel that he is defending their interests. That's the extraordinary mm. thing. Um, you know, when mm. you go out onto the streets in Moscow or elsewhere, you get people parroting the Russian propaganda and saying he's doing what he must do to defend us. They really believe it. Mm. And when propaganda is that pervasive, it hits home. Diana, well, as always, thanks so much, Diana Magne there. Uh, we're going to have a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The rest of the week will stay unsettled with localised flooding, but southwesterly winds mean it'll be very mild. Rain will continue to clear northern parts of the UK this morning while lingering across northern England and North Wales and a bunch of Ireland. To the south, it'll be mainly dry, but there'll be plenty of cloud around, which will bring some light rain to the hills. Scotland and North West Ireland can expect some sunshine, but the Western Isles will see showers moving in by lunchtime. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, right, uh, just as we wrap up the show, Mari's back with us, uh, as you can see, and uh, we're going to go through a couple of the front pages to touch on some stories that we haven't perhaps uh, so far. Well, the Times leads on news that the failed. Asylum, that failed asylum seekers will be offered thousands of pounds to encourage them to move to Rwanda under a voluntary scheme drawn up by ministers. Mari, I think this is really interesting. I mean, we're waiting, of course, for the main uh, part of the Rwanda bill to get through the House of uh, Lords uh, at the moment. This is a sort of add-on to that, that uh, failed asylum seekers who are already here, the Rwanda bill's obviously more focused on immediately returning those that arrive freshly from, from small boats, um, will be given a voluntary option to go to Rwanda. Yeah, I mean, the government essentially is trying to explain that voluntary uh, options are also a massive incentive. They want people to voluntarily go there as well to kind of add to the numbers of people that are going to Rwanda. So the government are trying to essentially show that they're using different, uh, you know, different tactics almost to reduce uh, net migration as well as illegal migration. OK, bit of a gear change, guys. Uh, the <laughs> Sun, it's reporting that Paul O'Grady has left 15.5 million in his will, with 125,000 set aside to look after uh, his five pet dogs. I mean, I love this. Mm. 25 <laughs> grand per dog, but of 15 million, you know, maybe... A lot's going to charity. Lots I, I guess a, a parting act of kindness. Yeah, it is quite... Quite an uh, extraordinary uh, culture here that uh, all of this is public on death in, in the UK. Mm. Uh, we are just ending with a couple of the snaps for you from the Sony World Photography 
uh, competition. We'll leave you with those. We, we spoke to the uh, photographers of these two pictures earlier in the day and uh, we want to leave you with their images and congratulate them again on their wins. So we're out of time here on The Breakfast Show. Thanks so much for joining us. Sky News Today is next.